You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? You're watching slash listening slash enjoying greatly the Command Zone podcast. <laughs> Today, I am one of your esteemed hosts, Jimmy Wong. And I'm your other host, Rachel Weeks. Esteemed host. I'm uh, your other esteemed host. Yeah. Excuse me. I love how you're assuming they're enjoying. We just started. <laughs> Well, they are on the road to enjoying, <laughs> and they better be enjoying now because we've already got one yuck and yum out of the way with that fun joke. Uh, thanks. Because we got a long one in front of us today. It's uh, the toughest commanders to brew in Wilds of Eldraine. Yeah, we already had an episode about the most powerful commanders in the set, but we play commanders, so we know that power isn't everything. Nope. So today we're talking about some of the commanders that are a little bit trickier to brew. They require some more things to go right, or they have some more technical choices. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just unlock some cool old cards. Yeah, uh, and of course, if you want to get some of those cards, because we're talking about plenty today, you can head on over to our sponsor, cardkingdom.com slash command. That is the affiliate link that you enter into your little browser window to get to the best cards card retailer in the world that's right cardkingdom.com slash command has every single sealed product that you could want right now and you can order them all by putting them into one handy dandy cart you can even copy paste an entire deck list from architect you can do so many different ways to get the cards you want choose the style the the quality the the, the set it's from whatever put it on the one cart order it all at once have it all arrive on your doorstep at the same time nothing beats convenience when it comes to building decks you don't want to have a billion cards coming from a billion different places who even bought a billion cards recently not me but you can buy that nice specialized selection at cardkingdom.com slash command and support the show while you're doing so. Yeah, you can also support the show over at ultrapro.com slash command to pick up some of the highest quality magic accessories in the business. They've got deck boxes and sleeves, binders, uh, play mats, dice, anything that you need to make sure that your battle field is clearly represented and looking cool so cool i know that this is the time of of set this is the time in the set <laughs> where everyone's building a new deck so i know i always have to pick up a couple new boxes of sleeves and a couple yep. new deck boxes to make sure that my cards are protected and we trust ultra pro to do that so make sure that your new decks and your old collection are protected and sorted and safe uh by using ultra pro products and supporting the show at ultrapro.com slash command and when those cards are all protected up maybe you want to debut them in front of josh and myself Ooh, on game nights what a transition right now game nights auditions are live that's right if you're a patron of the show at patreon.com slash command zone you can audition to be in game nights we do the fan auditions every single year we just released our fan episode this year they're one of our favorite episodes to film because we get to play with you our fans we get thousands of auditions and you can be amongst them and get a chance to become a game night get knighted play at the office it's a really great experience so head on over to patreon.com slash command zone you have to be an active patron of the show to audition you can totally sign up just to be an auditioner and then cancel your subscription after we don't care because we just want to sort of narrow down the field a little bit Otherwise, we're going to be getting tens of thousands instead of just thousands of uh, auditions. And also, we love our patrons and want to make sure that we are giving them the chance to be on the show uh, because they're a true fan. It's called the Fan Audition for a reason. So head on over to patreon.com slash command zone. We'll also have the links in the show notes about the exact rules and specifications. So you can read all about that in more detail in the show notes. Uh, this year, there's a special thing going on oh, that right. uh, there. We always pick two fans to participate in that episode. One of them will be chosen from among our patrons, and the other will be chosen from among our annual patrons. So you do get a special bonus if you subscribe to an annual patronship. Plus, there's some <laughs> uh, cool bonuses to being a patron, like you get access to all of our content early, and we shout out one lucky, e lucky patron, patron every single podcast episode. And this one is dedicated to Mike, Mike Claire. Out. Out. Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, you rock. Also, one more thing about annual patrons, you save money. That so too. if you know you're going to subscribe to the Patreon for at least a year, you get to do so and get, a, I think it's like 15, 16% off the actual annual price. Yeah. And of course, an additional slot will be opened for specifically those patrons to be on the show. Okay. Okay. Let's get into it. There are some sweet new commanders in the uh, Wilds of Eldraine set uh we're going to be talking about the ones that are sort of got our gears turning in terms of when you look at it and you're like "Ooh, how do you make that work what's what does that 99 look like and this first one was one of the biggest 
commander. I think everybody in the office looked at this one and was like, oh. Whoa, I want to make this. Yeah, it's Agatha of the Vile Cauldron. For just a red and a green, two-mana commander already getting some eyebrows going. <laughs> it's a 1-1 human warlock that says, activated abilities of creatures you control cost X less to activate, where X is Agatha of the Vile Cauldron's power. That effect, this effect, can't reduce the mana and that costs to less than one mana. Okay, activated abilities make cheaper by her power. And then Agatha has this ability for a red and a green. Other creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain trample and haste until end of turn. So pretty cool, actually. Just by herself, the ability is actually three red and a green, right? Yes, for sure. Uh, because she is naturally a 1-1. One, one. So all of your activated abilities in the deck are reduced by one when Agatha's on the field. But of Down course... to one mana. Uh, they're reduced, but yeah, that's true. You can't reduce it all the way down to zero. Um, but, uh, of course, if you buff Agatha's power using any number of means, then including you can... Including her own ability. Including <laughs> her, her own ability, you get more of a discount. Yeah. Uh, feels very gruel and, uh, very brewy, which makes sense, because she's, she's got a big green, uh... Cauldron. Big green cauldron. That's, uh, that's great. First thing you think of, oh, uh, and this is a very special, uh, command. Oh, that's right. Uh... Big time spoiler. Two yeah. spoilers in one. Someone plays this in the upcoming game nights, and that someone is... It's Brian Kibler. Wow, world Brian champion. Kibler. He's good at magic. Is he a world champion? I know he's like a three-time pro tour he's champion. A, he's a pro tour champion. World I don't know. champion. He's, he's in the Hall of Fame. He definitely is in the Hall of Fame, and he's Which definitely... Is in the world? He's definitely better than magic at magic than I am. <laughs> Well, the first thing that you look at when you think of Agatha is you're like, okay, what are the activated abilities I'm putting in this deck? Yeah, and there are plenty throughout the history of magic, but of course you are uh, limited to red, green, and colorless. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of different activated abilities. They can do just about anything that you could possibly think of in magic. So we broke down some of the really powerful ones just to give you an idea of what you can do with Agatha, uh, starting with one of the most powerful activated ability creatures in Commander. It's Walking Ballista. Yeah, and you may be thinking, wait, you activate the ability to take counters off to do damage, but no, there's actually another one on Walking Ballista where you pay four mana, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. You can get that, that down to one. That means that you just pay one, deal one, one damage. One damage, yeah, because you put the counter on and you can remove it and deal damage to any target. Yeah, plus this, you could build this with a little plus one counter synergy and that's how you buff Agatha. Ooh, wow. Yeah, so Walking Ballista is an extremely good card in this deck for that reason. Actually, Walking Ballista, you could argue, goes in almost every commander deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of cards like that. The Invokers are a very cool cycle for Agatha. Uh, Invokers' classic thing is they have activated abilities. Usually they cost eight. This one is Balls Invoker. Two and a red for a Dragon Shaman. It has an activated ability that says eight colon. Balls Invoker deals four damage to each opponent. Okay. Now if you get that down to one, that's a lot of lightning bolts. Yeah, obviously we're talking a little bit of Magic Christmas Dreamland to get from eight to one, which means Agatha's a seven-seven. Ah, you're um, in gruel. You're in gruel. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of ways to pump her. We'll talk about it in a little bit. But at what point would you be happy with this activated ability? I mean... This is instant speed. So the the fact that you can do it on your end step and hold up mana to do something else or activate something else yeah. makes this really, really good. Where you're mm -hmm. like, if I have four mana open and this is down to four, I'm going to activate it. Totally. Uh, even if that that cost doesn't feel good, like as we're talking about it, in a game, if you can deal four damage to each player reliably, yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with like anything four or less. Yeah, and you're in the mana geyser colors too. So you could have 30 mana or whatever. And oh, yeah. then even activating this four or five times is Big time killing people. And doesn't require Balls Invoker to tap. So you could just, by the way, play Balls Invoker oh, yeah. and then use it on the same turn. Seems pretty good. Pay two, pay two, pay two, pay two, pay two. Pay two. You've pay two. done 20 damage. Yeah. Uh, you can also use activated abilities to make a ton of mana. This first one is so powerful. Yeah, very stack. good. It is Magus of the Candelabra. One of the rare times that the creature version is more powerful than the artifact right? version. This is a single green for a human wizard with an activated ability that says X tap, untap X target lands. Okay, so normally if you just have five lands out, you tap five, you tap this, you untap the five lands, and it's like, okay, that nothing happens. You got the same mana back. If you have like the, the dual, the lands that tap for two, then, then oh cool you're, you're getting up mana but in this mana case doubler or something let's say you want to untap x target five target lands and it costs you one mana that you seems good. have gained mana that is a very serious mana dork uh it's really really cool in this deck every time that i i think these two things work really really well together uh because it can produce both red and green mana so you can activate that's right 
Yeah, and, and you may find that, you know, if you want to activate Agatha a bunch of times, because it's four red and a green, that you need to untap certain types of mana as well. Yeah. Yeah. But if you only need red mana... <laughs> <laughs> Soulbright Flamekin has this weird ability. You pay two, target creature gains trample until end of turn. However, if this is the third time this ability is resolved this turn, you can add red, 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 red to your mana pool. I think I did it right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So if you pay or two... Or maybe less. Wait. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, eight. <laughs> <laughs> if you pay two three times, you would normally make eight mana. So yeah, so six for eight. Cool. Yeah. Okay. But if you pay three and make eight, That's now we're talking. You're and five. this activated ability only costs two. So it's naturally reduced to as low as it can go with Agatha and no buff on the board. That's right, because she's a one one. This will become a one mana ability. Pretty sweet to just have you could go Agatha, Sorbright Flamekin make so much mana and then just keep popping off yeah you've got activated abilities so the more mana you have the more things you can do pump that into your bags of the candelabra <laughs> you're, you're, there you go <laughs> and they don't tap all your lands you're cooking now yeah no you're brewing you're brewing you're cauldroning that's true okay uh there's also ways to get card advantage you can draw cards duskwatch recruiter has two and a green could just be green. Look at the top three cards of your library. You can reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand. And then the rest go on the bottom of your library in any order. Yeah. Uh, that card is great card advantage. And you're going to have a lot of creatures in this deck because of your commander's Agatha's ability. ability yeah. uh, Vivian's Grizzly does a similar thing, but the activated ability is three and a green. It says look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature or a planeswalker card, you may reveal it, put it into your hand. If you don't put it in your hand, put it on the bottom. Yeah. So you can also just pay green to draw any creatures or planeswalkers or basically have a scry effect where you mm -hmm. can just put stuff on the bottom until you want it. And it's a May ability as well. Oh, yeah. No, 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 it's not. If you don't do it, it has to go on the bottom of your library. Yeah. So it's like a forced scry. Yeah, it's still like if you have a high, high density of creatures in your deck, which it feels like you're going to yeah. do, uh, this is a great card draw engine for very, very cheap. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people were excited about this one that Svela Ice Shaper has two abilities that are both affected by Agatha. The first one, you pay three and create a colorless snow artifact token named Icy Manolith that taps for any color. And for six of red and green, you kind of do the Golos thing. You look at the top four cards of your library and you can cast a spell from among them without paying their mana cost. Sweet. Yeah, so you've got a nice cheap one that if your Agatha is only a two drop or like a, is one or Even two power, drop, yeah. then uh, it's reduced. Power, yeah. And then if Agatha's big and you're really popping off, you can start dumping mana into Svela. Yeah, and that's uh, a win con. For yeah, sure. for sure. You can turn that activate those activated abilities into creatures. I like these a lot, especially this first one. It's Ardos, Cobbler of War. Nice. One in a red for a goblin shaman. It's a one one with haste. Whenever... Ardos or another creature enters the battlefield under your control. That creature gets plus two plus O until end of turn. Mm. Great. It's a buff for Agatha. Uh, and then an activated ability that says three in a red. Create a one one red goblin creature token with haste. Activate only as a sorcery. Ooh. So the sorcery thing is a little bit tricky. But if you're firing these off, you're paying a single. Like if, if you have Ardos a dose on the battlefield on mm -hmm. two and then you bring Agatha, Agatha down, it's immediately buffed to a 3-1, so this immediately costs red, and then you can pay red, red, red. Make some goblins that are all make, three ones. Yeah, three ones with haste, or just, you know, have them chill back. Yeah, or do That's something else. With the really, really good rate, and a great way to build up a lot of defenses. Yeah, you can already see the combos with Soulbright Flamekin, Magus of the Candelabra. They're all ways to get more red mana and blammo. You're off to the races. Uh, Jade Mage does the same, but it's two and a green for a 1-1 one, one green sapling creature token. There's great cards with interaction on their activated abilities. This one is busted in the deck. It's Captivating <laughs> yeah. Crew, has an activated ability of three and a red. Gain control of target creature and opponent controls until end of turn. Untap it, it gains haste. Activate this ability only as you could cast a sorcery. So Yikes. if you can get this down to red, you can build yourself a little uh, insurrection. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. And costs about as much of an insurrection too. Mm. Um same interaction, you got Valakut Invoker. So like Balls Invoker, it's very similar. It's eight mana. In this case, it does three damage to any target. So instead of four to each opponent, this is now able to smack down Lightning Bolt stuff. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, start picking off creatures. Who doesn't love Lightning Bolt? If you can really, really get Agatha's power buffed up, there are some huge activated abilities that you can sink a lot of mana into. Uh, I like this first one. It's Death's Kiss. This is a six mana Beholder. It has an activated ability that says XX Red, Monstrosity X. And then when Death Kiss becomes monstrous, goad up to X target creatures your opponent's control. And then you put X counters onto the Death Kiss. Yeah, so all those creatures are 
are goaded, but Death Kiss also says at the top, whenever oh, yeah. a creature in the opponent controls attacks one of your opponents, double its power until end of turn. Ha ha! Nice. Goaded and just massive. Yeah, so you can make a, make a real mess with that one. Yeah, same thing goes for Pelucranos World Eater with the same XX green in this case for a Monstrosity X. And then it's going to deal X damage divided as you choose amongst any number of creatures your opponents control. And then they sort of deal their damage back to Pelucranos. But it's a kind of a green damage based board wipe in a way. Yeah. And green doesn't have great board wipes, we'll say that much. Definitely. You can do a lot of really sweet stuff with activated abilities. Again, if you're, deck, you're like, I want to build a token version of this, look for the token ones. Yeah. But if you just uh, want to invoker everyone out and do the invoker go. version. Make burn deck. Or a big, huge mana into Storm, even. Jeez, because you're just making like 70 mana some turns. Blech. Blech. Uh, this the next category is, of course, send Agatha to the gym. Yeah, get some muscles on Agatha so she can... Actually, that's very Brian Kibler-esque now you think about it. Because he's <laughs> yeah. always deadlifting something on Twitter, I swear. <laughs> she just lifts her cauldron. Yeah, over and over again, and yeah. And yeah. the more creatures that are in it, the ah. heavier and stronger she gets. <laughs> so this is like the Hallmark card from the set that will go in this deck if you build it, because it's just so good. It's so good in most decks. Yeah, actually, this in my Marchesa deck is nutty as well. So it's Agatha's Soul Cauldron. It's a two-mana legendary artifact. It's the cauldron. Uh, you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate abilities of creatures you control. So that's super good with all of the cards that we talked about that are like three in a red make a token because you may not have a bunch of red. You could have red and green mixed in. So now you can use any mana to activate abilities. And it says creatures you control with plus one plus one counters on them have all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with Agatha's Soul Cauldron. Okay, and then you can tap the Soul Cauldron to exile a card from a graveyard. When a creature card is exiled this way, put the plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. So this is redundancy. And it also makes Agatha buffed and gives her the ability of anything that Agatha Soul Cauldron exiled. So if you lose your Invoker, exile with set Agatha Soul Cauldron, put a woman counter on any creature, maybe Agatha, because you want to get buffer, and now she has that ability. Seems really, really good. Does everything this deck wants to do appropriately. It's her cauldron. Yeah, yeah. So obviously this is a must play in the deck. It does literally everything you want it to do. If you already have also synergies with plus and plus one counters, that means your other creatures gain the abilities as well. Mm -hmm. So it's redundancy. People basically have to kill the cauldron if they want to stop the mayhem. Yeah. Uh, of course, there are tons of ways to buff creatures in Gruel. We wanted to run down a couple of cool ones. I wanted to mention Komenu Battle Armor. It's two and a red for an equipment dog. A good dog. It says menace, and equipped creatures gets plus two, plus two, and has menace. And whenever Komenu Battle Armor or equipped creature deal combat damage to a player, goad each creature that player controls, and it has reconfigure four. The neat thing about reconfigure in this deck is it's an activated ability of a creature. Oh. So you can reduce it with Agatha. Yeah. And then, by the way, if the creature that it's equipped to dies, it comes off and just becomes the dog again, right? And with Agatha's Soul Cauldron, you can reconfigure other creatures onto... Oh. It doesn't do anything, but you can. <laughs> just to randomly have and reconfigure on. And that's neat. That is neat. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, plus one, plus one counters to match with Agatha's Soul Cauldron. There's Agitator Ant, uh, which allows you to put two one-one counters, but everyone can do it, but the creatures get goaded. Uh, but more importantly, I love this one, Halana and Elena oh, partners. so good. Yeah, I play this in my Xenagos deck, and it is nasty. Every deck I've put it in, I'm like, that card's just really good. Yeah, it's, when you see a card, by the way, because this card often pops up in cube, when you see a card in cube that when it gets played, takes over a game, mm. there's a good chance it's also good in Commander, and yeah, there's one of those sure. cards. So there's a uh, four mana, two, three. Uh, it says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, put X 1-1 counters on another target creature where X is a Halana and Elena's power, and that creature gains haste. So it starts as a two, three. Uh, this spirals out of the control, obviously, if you get Halana and Elena, even a little bit buffer with anything else. Mm -hmm. What I like about this card is it both buffs Agatha and gives your creatures with activated abilities haste. Yeah. Because there are going to be some tap abilities like your, oh, your right. Magus of the Candelabra or something Yeah, yeah. Like that. So you have this out and then you can put the counters on something, give it haste, and then that rest of your turn is nuts. Yeah. Seems really powerful. Uh, I like Hero's Blade in decks that just want their commander to be a little bit bigger. Yep. This is a two mana equipment that it says equip creature gets plus three plus two and whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield, you can snap Hero's Blade right onto it without paying any additional mana yeah you could also so, throw us on halana and elena <laughs> yeah and then you <laughs> put five it gets Oof. really really powerful Barf. Barf. um super cheap and giving your commander plus three plus three is enormous in a deck like this plus three plus two yeah sorry 
You better. It's her be. power that matters. It is her power. It's it is our, it's our power that matters. <laughs> I'm, you got to be tough too, guys. Don't yeah. forget. Okay. Uh, next up is a new one. That's Ozolith, the Shattered Spire. It allows to basically uh, harden scales any plus one plus one counter, so it adds an additional. And then it also allows you to one in a green tap it, put a one one counter on an artifact or creature you control, and activate only as a sorcery. I really like Ozolith in this deck. Uh, especially if you're building around counters, of course, but because it's a way to repeatedly put more counters on Agatha without investing a ton of cards into it. Yep. Uh, a classic, if you want your commander to be big, there's no <laughs> card better than Raised by Giants. So silly. Five and a green for a background, very expensive. Commander creatures you own have base power and toughness, 10-10, and are giants in addition to their other types. <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is like a finisher, and chances are you have to cast recast Agatha a bunch in this deck. If people She's are, scary. Yeah, you gotta kill her. Raised by Giants for the end game, because it's like, oh no, I gotta get Agatha out and give her a bunch of ways to get one one counter. It's like, no, no, no. Just have Raised by Giants out, play Agatha, instantly pop off. Yeah. Uh, love Raised by Giants in this deck. The more and more I looked at it, the better Agatha gets, even if she just has two power. Yeah. So I did put a couple of ways in the deck that are just sort of cheeky ways to get one counter onto Agatha. Nice. Uh, and Lanawar Reborn is a really good one. It's a land, taps for green, enters tapped, and it has Graft 1, which if you're not familiar, it says well, this land enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield, you may move a plus one counter from this land on to it Woo. so it just stores a counter it's a great land on turn one and then you pay play a mountain get Agatha out immediately on two yeah i like that well probably not you want something with an activated ability first anyway and, and depending on your build slash play group you could also strap an ancestral mask onto agatha which gives it plus two plus two for each other enchantment on the battlefield oh. this could just be a really easy way to get her up to plus eight plus eight you know, just because people have enchantments and nettle cyst if you are running like a heavy artifact build with your komenu battle armors gives it plus one plus one for each artifact effect and or enchantment you control yeah a so. lot of really really cool ways to buff agatha i would probably pick one way and try and make sure you maximize those yeah. synergies whether you're going with equipment or counters or anthem effects that kind of thing uh, of course, Totes if we are reducing the activated ability cost of things, that means there's going to be some c -c 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 combo potential. Yeah, this is the boring part for me, but it's also the one that many, many players are interested in. Uh, look, you can make infinite mana in a lot of different ways in this deck. If you if, really, and I hate saying this, you can just go on to the your, your local search engine, yeah. not your library. And type in the words Agatha and then infinite combo, and you'll find plenty of ways to do it. We won't cover them here right now. There's going to be lots. Yeah. All right, let's keep Oh, moving. no, one huh? more thing about Agatha. Yeah. The reason that these types of commanders are really good is because she cares about something that will happen on magic cards for the remainder of time, oh, yeah. which is activated abilities on red and green creature cards. So in the future, you will have lots of chances to upgrade a deck like this and add in a new card from a new set that's interesting, like Komenu Battle Armor. Yeah. It's a great example of like, holy crap, reconfigure is on the creature card, but it's also an equipment. Hasn't ever happened, but just happens to work really well with this commander. So if you want to build a deck that is going to have future proofing to it, this is one of those commanders that does it. Yeah. Uh, really, really neat. And I, I love commanders that I'm always like going back to read, you know, yeah. or to, I'm, I'm always, always going back to, and I'm always looking for new cards yep. that are going to be That's good. That's my Marchesa deck. Uh, and this, this next, next one is not a future proofed commander. No, it's not. It's Beluna Grand Squall. Uh, green, a blue, and a red, so Teemer. This is a 4-4 giant noble legendary. Uh, she has an adventure spell that's called Seek Thrills. It's two green, blue, and a red for an instant adventure. Mill seven cards, then put all cards that have an adventure from among the milled cards into your hand. And her creature ability is Trample. Permanent spells you cast that have an adventure cost one less to cast. Okay, so it makes your adventures cost less and it uh, is and a three-mana commander, but it has a five-mana instant ability that lets you mill seven cards and then put some adventures back into your hand. Adventures have only appeared in two sets, Throne of Eldraine and Wilds of Eldraine. Ah, uh, they've also been in uh, Commander Legends. Oh, Baldur's that's Gate. right. There are some adventures in Baldur's Gate. I'm so sorry. But uh, it is a dangerous mechanic. Who knows how many, many more sets we will see yeah, with yeah. it. Um, so a couple of rules questions. This is a commander with an adventure. We've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing is, yes, you can cast both spells from the command zone. So you could cast the instant side directly, or you could cast the creature side directly. When you cast the instant, you can choose to send it on an adventure 
or you could send it back to the command zone. Not recommended that one. You could if you just want to cast the instant again. Again, yeah. It's going to, however, be affected by commander tax. Yes. The way that commander tax works is every time a card leaves the command zone that you cast it, every time you cast a card from the command zone, it gets the tax. So it, regardless of which way you cast it, if you cast the spell, send it back to the command zone, and you cast the creature side this time, the creature side costs five. It does cost two more. Two more, To yeah. cast. Yep. Um, so... Let's talk about this card. How many... To- and we're in Teamer, by the way, so we're not even playing all of the adventure cards. Yeah. To- this isn't like Tom Bombadil or something. Right, that where you get all the sagas. sagas. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the first question is, how many cards are there with adventure in Teamer? Well, you did the research. I so did. Why don't you tell the people? There's 39 that exist currently. Okay. Uh, that are legal currently. And there are 27 more that will be legal in Teamer from Wilds of Eldraine, which means okay. 66 adventure spells that are legal in Baluna altogether. Okay, so that means that there are definitely enough to make a deck where adventures matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, whether or not they're good or not, we'll talk about in a second. Let's talk about the mill part of this, where you're milling seven and you can put any number of cards back into your hand that have the adventure ability. So what is the general number in your mind viewer, as well as our minds will tell you what we think, that you want to draw in order for this to be like, cool, I'm doing the thing and I did it in a way that makes me feel good. Yeah, if you're paying five mana in three colors <laughs> for an, an instant, yeah, I want to draw three cards. Yeah. I think. Like, I want to reliably draw three cards. And if you're drawing two or one, sucks. Yeah, it drawing feels four bad. or five, awesome. Yeah. Seven, not, not going to happen. <laughs> but you want to be like mathematically prepared to draw roughly three. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just like paying five mana to draw two reliably, yep. which yep. doesn't seem very good. Doesn't seem good at all. Uh, unless you're focused on the mill part of it. Again, we'll talk about that later as well. Yeah. Uh, so the next question was like, okay, so if I want to reliably draw three, how many adventure cards do I have to run? <laughs> yeah. So again, there are 66 total. And typically in decks that are like creatures matter, spells matter, you want to have at least 30 yeah. of that kind of card in the deck. So let's look at the numbers here. So if you ran 30 adventure cards, let's let that's like where we start when we have a theme. You will draw 3 cards 35.8% of the time. Yep. A little low low that Oh yeah, that's very like low. 40% of the time I get the what I want minimally. 36% yeah, to be closer. 36. Not be, great. Not yeah. a, I rounded way up. Not not ideal. Um, so I was like, okay, what if I run 35? Okay. Remember now we're running over half of the adventure spells that in, possible. in existence. <laughs> uh, you'll draw three cards 47.7% of the time. That's almost a coin flip about 50% of the time. Okay. That's a little better, but not still not great. Yeah. So I was like, all right, if you run 40 adventure cards, you run like roughly two thirds of the adventure cards in existence. Now you're definitely running some poopy ones. Yeah. You will draw three cards. of the time. Now that number, I'm like, cool, 60%, that's up there. I wish it was 30 adventures, you're going to get 60% of the time, but that is not the case. Also, by the time you cast that other side, you may have drawn some of them into your hand, so your percentage actually might be a little lower. The percentage changes throughout the game, for sure. The longer the game goes as well. Uh, Yeah, this is only a rough estimate, but what this says to me is that this, as a draw spell, is going to be very tough to build around. Um, because like even running 40 adventure spells and that's like, if you're on 40 adventure spells, 36 lands. Yeah. Would you have no like, room for any of the cards? Very few a soul rank. of slots <laughs> remain. Uh, Some fixing, it's teamer. <laughs> so it, it looks, it looks a little, a little rough, uh, Sus. to really, really build around that instant. Yeah. So you're not really building around the instant side of it unless you really want to just basically have a self mill card that's a commander in your command zone that you may play zero adventures that just says mill yourself for seven for five mana which isn't nothing um i could certainly see it being this just being like a teamer spells deck that wants spells in the graveyard yeah you could maybe throw it into a riku of two reflections yeah. deck or whatever that is it wants better than to. riku i don't know but if you're really into baluna i think that's probably something you can do yeah uh but let's talk about adventures and let's just see what you can do with an adventure deck generally because she does have another ability that says permanent spells you cast that have an adventure cost one less to cast yep so, so Rules question again, if I cast a 
let's say the first one up, Beanstalk Giant. It's yeah. six in the green for a giant that has an adventure that costs two in the green. The adventure is technically on a permanent. Does the adventure cost get reduced by one? It's not a permanent spell. Uh, ah. The sorcery you will pay the full price for. You're going to pay two in a green for that adventure. But Beanstalk Giant just costs five in a green. Wow, six mana for a big giant. <laughs> okay. Not a great reduction we're either, to a good start. if we're honest. But this is still one of the better adventure cards because it allows you to at least rampant growth on the front side, yeah. uh, or on the adventure side. Two and a green, not great rate, but it, the giant itself costs less to cast later on. It is worth mentioning that like we're talking about you know, drawing three cards it, if it's a normal card. Drawing three adventure cards is kind of like drawing six overcosted spells. Oh, right, because you get to cast both sides of them. Right, so they... They're sort of one and a half cards. Uh, but then they're back down to one card because they're all not that great. <laughs> yeah, ye, ye, some of them, it's tough. It's t it's really a tough thing to evaluate. But there are some really, really sweet adventure cards that we've got to mention. Of course, this deck runs Brazen Borrower, one of the best adventure spells yep. of all time. It's got Petty Theft that bounces an online permanent and then gives you a 3-1 flyer that can smack the daylights out of your opponents. Yeah, that's nice. Um, uh, Illithid Harvester is one of the Baldur Gate, Baldur's Gate adventures. X blue blue for the sorcery side adventure. You can tap X target creatures and then they get iced over. They don't untap during their next untap steps. It's a sorcery though, kind of sucks there. Uh, and then the creature side is four in the blue. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, turn any number of target tap creatures into non-token creatures face down. They become two two horrors. Yep, not flipping hey, those up. There you They're go. stuck. Yeah, They're frozen in the ice. And they can be any. They don't need to be tapped by the adventure side either. And by the way, you don't have to cast the adventure before you cast the card itself. You can still yep. just cast the regular card. Yeah, uh, adventure spells give you a choice. Yeah. Uh, if you want to lean more into the mill route, I think Merfolk Secret Keeper is really cool. It's a uh, yeah. venture is blue for sorcery. Target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. Yeah. And then it just gives you a little zero four creature. But we'll talk about like, obviously, a zero four is not worth a card in commander, but you can abuse that uh, later. Yeah. Uh, sea Hag. <laughs> This art and name is just crazy to me. Uh, four in the blue, three, five for the creature side. That when it enters the battlefield, gives your creatures minus four, opponent's control minus four, minus oh, until end of turn. But aquatic ingress, two in the blue, and adventure instant up to two target creatures each get plus one, plus oh, until the end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. Yeah, so you make a big beanstalk unblockable on one turn and then you get this sort of mini. Really leaning into the here. adventure side now. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, you'll play it for the adventure side. This is a new fun one. Yeah. Virtue of Strength. Uh, the adventure is just a green mana to return target creature or land from your graveyard to your hand. Very nice. And then the enchantment side is five green, green. If you tap a basic land for mana, it produces three times as much of that mana instead. So it's like a Nyx Bloom Agent for, for your base. basics. You are in a three-color deck, so it may not be as good here. Oh, right. But the recursion is really nice, and having that option to be to get some more mana, yeah, and or to fetch up a bunch of basics, um, is probably worth a slot if you're dedicated to adventures. One of my favorite adventure cards in the new set is Bramble Familiar. It's nice. Uh, the adventure side is five green green for a sorcery. It says mill seven cards, then put a creature, enchantment, or land card from among the milled cards onto the battlefield. So you're doing more mill stuff. Get, uh, get a little value out of it. But its creature side says tap, add green. So it's a little mana dork. And also one in a green tap, discard a card, return Bramble Familiar to its owner's hand. Cool. So the neat thing about this is you can recast the adventure side again, recast the creature, bounce it back to your hand. And you can do sort of a slow loop. <laughs> <laughs> it's so slow. Yeah, but it's a it's raccoon. It's so slow. Right? It is a raccoon. It's an elemental, elemental raccoon. raccoon. It's really cute. There's some cool payoffs for casting adventures. Um, some from Baldur's Gate, some from Eldraine. Yeah, Lozon, Dragon's Legacy, three, a red and a blue for a flyer, four, two, whenever you cast an adventure or dragon, Lozon deals damage equal to that spell's mana value to any target that isn't a commander. So it can go face. Uh, this is close to probably one of your like finishers in the deck to just cast a big old adventure spell and smacks people for it. 
Yeah, it's also a 4-2 flyer, which helps a little bit. Uh, if you played in standard during <laughs> Throne of Eldraine, first of all, I'm sorry. Thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah, so uh, sorry. But you're familiar with these next few cards. It's Edgewall Innkeeper. Whenever you cast a creature spell that has an adventure, draw a card. Yeah, super and good. And Lucky Clover. Whenever you cast an adventure, instant or sorcery spell, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. This is a two-mana artifact that was banned in standard. <laughs> yeah, and it's an absolute must-play in the deck. And you can see how powerful it was because they reprinted it and it's now four mana <laughs> oh right chancellor of tales is the new version of it three in the blue for a two three whenever you cast an adventure you may copy it and you may choose new targets for the copy that's adventure spell not specifically instant or sorcery so yeah. that's kind of cool you can you know, if there's a i don't know and in, i don't know actually is there instant and sorceries is usually the adventures ah, i don't well, think it's there's a little a permanent broader. on the little one yeah Maybe. it's re- it there's is no way differently yeah, yeah they're, it is they're differently. their options so there you go uh, I think if you're playing this duck, you're really, really build, building around Lucky Clover, so you do want some ways to go find it. Uh, I really like Goblin Engineer in this deck, is that ETBs can put the uh, Clover into Ooh, the bin, okay. and then it has an ability that says red, tap, sack an artifact, return target artifact with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Plus you're milling, you could probably have some artifacts in there that you want. Yeah, if you want to stay on theme, Emery, Lurker of the Lock, is an Eldraine card and does mm-hmm. a similar thing. Yeah. Let's you get stuff out of the graveyard if you're milling all of your mana rocks with yeah. your commander. Okay, how do you uh what do you what do you want to do in this deck? Do you want to maybe get some value? Because I feel like you need to lean heavily onto the boy, it's janky, but I got so much value it overcomes the jankiness. Yeah, it's um it feels like you really want to abuse that your the modality of the deck. Like yeah. it's gonna be kind of a mid-rangey control deck. You wanna make sure that you're casting your spells a lot. You wanna make sure you have a ton of mana. But you have these, like, all of your spells, all of your interaction are attached to creatures. Mm-hmm. So there are ways to reuse them, like Team or Sabertooth. <laughs> Shocking is good. Shocking. Uh, one in a green, you may return another creature you control to its owner's hand. If you do, Team or Sabertooth gains indestructible until the end of turn. Okay, so you get you your a, creature back. You have you a creature, it. yeah. On the battlefield, you can bounce it to your hand at instant speed. If it's got a bounce spell or a counter spell or any kind of interaction as the adventure side... It's a great surprise. Well, it wouldn't be a surprise. It's a great deterrent. <laughs> yeah, Brazen Borrower, getting that back into your hand is awesome, especially mm-hmm. at instant speed. Crystal Shard does a similar thing where you can pay a blue, tap it, and then return creature to its hand if its owner doesn't pay one. You're the controller. You Don't pay, pay one. one. Uh, it's also just sometimes good to get them at other players. Like, ah, you left no mana open. Bounce your huge 10 drop or whatever. Boink. Yeah. <laughs> If you want to really take advantage of those instants and sorceries that are on all of your permanents, there are ways to cast adventure spells from the graveyard. And I wanted to talk about this because it is a mill deck with adventures. Um, so cards like Gale Waterdeep Prodigy says, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery from your hand, you may cast up to one target card of the other type from the graveyard. Oh. That does not work in decks like this because oh. you're, it is a creature card in, in the, the graveyard. graveyard right. So a lot of people are like, oh, you can't cast adventure spells from your graveyard. But there are ways. For example, Lear Disciple of the Drowned says three blue blue and it's each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard has flashback. The flashback cost is equal to that card's mana cost. Hmm. So they are instants and sorceries and they are in your graveyard. They're not the cards, but they do see that and give it and gain that ability. Okay. So Lear is like slightly different than Gale for some reason. (laughs) Uh, And, and Ren and six is the same way. Uh, if you alt Ren and Six. Yeah, specifically. Yeah, it's, it's minus seven. You get an yeah. emblem with instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard have retrace. Yeah, this works the exact same way. So you can you can cast the adventure spells from the graveyard and then they go on an adventure and you can cast them onto the battlefield. Strange. It How- is really weird. Okay, well, speaking of casting from exile... Uh- yeah, because you're gonna ca- you're gonna be casting a lot of spells from exile because they're on an adventure. Yeah, in exile. This is the best one by far, I think. Yeah, because cool. it has an adventure on it. It's Tillincolly Hunter, five green green. Uh, we just read its creature side. It says trample once each turn. You may pay zero rather than pay the mana cost for a creature spell you cast from exile. That's all your adventures, pretty much. Um, the adventure side of this allows you to exile a creature card from your graveyard until end of turn. You can, uh, end of your next turn. You may cast that card. Yeah. So that's cool. So you can adventure it, play it out the next turn, and then cast that thing for free. 
Really, really sweet card. It is expensive, but perfect for this deck. And then, of course, there's a ton of Cast from Exile synergies. We've talked about a lot of these cards in the past, but I wanted to mention there's a new one that's really sweet. It's Extraordinary Journey. Oh, this one's really cool. XX Blue Blue for an enchantment that says, when Extraordinary Journey enters the battlefield, exile up to X target creatures. For each of those cards, its owner may play it for as long as it remains exiled. Okay, so it ETBs, exiles a bunch of stuff, and they can cast them from exile. Then it says, whenever one or more non-token creatures enter the battlefield, if one or more of them entered from exile or was cast from exile, you draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. So, so cool. if you cast a creature spell from an adventure, you draw a card. Yeah, in general, this just comes down, you can play it for blue-blue. You don't even need to exile other things. Yeah. But I actually really just like this as just a huge tempo blowout. Like, I think this card's really, really good. You pay X is equal to two or whatever, you get rid of a two really important things your opponents have to recast them to get them again and you draw a card when they do and also just incidentally this will just get random other things that have creatures coming from exile or being cast from exile so that's kind of cool i really like extraordinary journey and it's great in this deck the other kind of cute one is mizix replica rider which is four and a red. Whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, you may pay one a, and a hybrid blue or is it? So two mana, but either blue or red. If you do, copy that spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. If the copy is a permanent spell, it gains haste and at the beginning of your next end step, sacrifice this permanent. Cool. Yeah, so you, every time you cast an adventure, the permanent side, you get a token copy of it. And if you're doing this kind of flashback nonsense, that will trigger uh, Mizzix as well. So you mm-hmm. get two of those copies. Yeah, now Feshni is a very similar effect to Mizzix mm-hmm. in terms of it makes copies. And then you have like Keeper of Secrets, which allows you to just nug someone for the amount, the mana value of the uh, spell from exile. They were anywhere other than your hand. So I guess these are kind of like finishers or like over the tops because you got to have a way to kill people yeah you really do need a payoff for this it feels like your adventure spells are your engine and yeah. you're getting a lot of value from them re- you know recasting ram spells recasting bounce spells yep but uh you do need something that's going to close out the game and uh i don't know it's a lot of beanstalk giants <laughs> yeah passion archaeologist as well as that classic background that allows you to ca- whenever you cast a spell from exile it deals damage your commander deals damage equal to that spells mana value to target opponent so these are the win cons i think in the deck for sure okay well, that's, that's baluna baluna not my favorite yeah, i wish i wish I it was a little think... bit more powerful but if you're really into adventures there's definitely a baluna yeah, i was gonna say brew. if you want to just if you're the kind of person that wants to brew the low power but fun themed deck and you could do you could have done this like with an energy commander from yeah. kaladesh right that's the kind of realm that this commander sits in um otherwise you may find some very fringe use cases for this commander and who knows if we go back to eldrain like 70 more times like ravnica maybe this just gets better over time yeah for sure but until then you're playing beanstalk giant so i don't know <laughs> all right next one is a fun one because spoiler alert it's also being featured on the upcoming wilds of eldrain game nights and it is being played by none other than yourself well, myself, Jimmy Wong. You're playing it. You're playing it. What's, Thanks for auditioning for Game you, Nights. Yeah, if you want to get mana screwed, you'll play it. Just kidding. Uh, that's a me specialty. So this is Bernard Ginger Sculptor. It's one, a green, a white, and a blue for a human artificer, 3-3. Three, three. Uh, I'm pretty sure this canonically is the character that made the ginger yeah, people that were running through the early uh, Eldrain trailers. He's the ginger brute uh, shaper. Yeah, and, yeah. And we'll talk about the other cookie he made a little later. Yeah, that's right. It's a good cookie. All right, this says, each creature you control that's a food or golem gets plus two, plus two, and has trample. Ooh, that's a big anthem. And whenever another non-token creature you control dies, you may exile it. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a 1-1 one, one food golem artifact creature in addition to its other types. And it gains the food text of pay two mana, tap it, sack this artifact, you gain three life. He turns your creatures into cookies. Yeah, into cookies, food golem artifacts. And instead of being one ones, they're actually buffed by him and they become three threes with trample. With a lot of creatures, that's bigger than they started. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because you're going to want to have non-token creatures that die and stuff that can sacrifice itself is where we're going to start. They're going to, they're their own cookie molds. Uh, there's a lot of fun cards here that do it. Uh, Benevolent Bodyguard is first on the list. There's the Doggy that does the same thing, Selfless Savior. Mm-hmm. So one mana creature, Human Cleric, and says, Sacrifice a target creature you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. The Benevolent, uh, the Savior, makes a creature indestructible, I believe. But it's a 1-1. One, one. You sack it to give something protection. It dies. It comes back as a 3-3 three, three food golem artifact creature token. Yeah. And you can sack again. Double the value. Yeah, or make multiple token copies. Wow. Uh, Sakura Tri Builder is one of, like... 
is a classic. Of course, it's going into this deck. You can activate it more and more and more. I guess just one extra time. <laughs> well, I just want to... That's all I want to do is activate Sakura Dry Builders. A billion I just want to search for basics. Speaking of basics, uh, Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath, doesn't have an activated ability that sacks himself, but he has an ETB that does it. Yeah, that's right. Whenever Uro enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. Whenever Uro enters the battlefield or attacks, you gain three life and draw a card, and then you put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. Yeah, and that's sweet. So with Bernard in play, you put Uro onto the battlefield, you get the ETB effect, you sacrifice it, trigger Bernard, bring it back, you get a second ETB effect, and a tiny cookie Uro? That gets sacrificed immediately. <laughs> Yeah, but for just a moment, you, you got get a, a cookie, cookie elder Uro. giant. <laughs> yeah, and I think you do actually have an, a, a moment the, the second time it comes back to use the food part of it to sacrifice it. That's cool. Uh, because it's an enter the battlefield ability that goes on the stack. So you could gain six life the I second guess, time yeah, you'd around. you have to give it haste. But still, Uro's really sweet in this deck. Yeah, you would have to give it haste. It's like a super explore. Yeah, um, Solitude is super sweet. Uh, because it enters the battlefield, you exile up to one other target creature, and then the creature's controller gains life equal to its power, so it swords the plowshares it. But if you evoke it by exiling a white card from your hand, it enters the battlefield, it gets sacrificed, it comes back, and it sticks around, and you get to exile two things with it. Ugh, so, so good. Double the fun, double mint gum. Uh, of course, anytime you have a commander that says dies, you want some sack outlets in this deck. Yeah, totally. I don't think this is quite like an aristocrat deck. These are more like value sack outlets so yeah. that you can make the cookies when it, it benefits you. Um, so I do think you probably want one or two. And for me, that means I'm running a high market as the land that taps to sacrifice a creature. It's free and it's always great and i'll probably run ashnod's altar because you sacrifice a creature for two mana and then you can use that two mana to sack food there you go wow to you eat just it. <laughs> if you're uh you're making some sweet tokens in this deck because yeah. all of your creatures become tokens so what of course do we want to do make more tokens i love that for sure. So this deck probably wants your Anointed Processions. It probably wants your Parallel Lies. Uh, it definitely wants your Mondrak Glory Dominuses. Glory because, Dominus! Because Mondrak doubles your tokens, but also is a sack outlet. Yeah, to one Phyrexian Phyrexian sack, two other artifacts and your creatures, and you get to put an indestructible counter on Mondrak. Seems great. Seems good. Um, I really like this one. Nesting Dovehawk, three in a white flyer. At the beginning of a combat on your turn populate another thing that gives you more tokens uh which means create a token that's a copy of a creature token you control imagine you got that solitude out there oh uh, baby uh, another sacred tribe elder go nuts <laughs> and then whenever a creature token enters the battlefield and you control you get to put a 1-1 counter on the nesting dev hawk so this also could just be a finisher just a huge flyer yeah huge flyer I definitely like Song of the World Soul in this deck. This often feels very expensive when, when you're making really sweet tokens like you are in this deck. You want this enchantment for four white and a white. Whenever you cast a spell, populate. Sweet. That's awesome. So if you have a great token, you can just keep making more. Well, by the way, uh, Bernard cares about golems, and there's a lot of golems in Magic's history that come on creatures that have ETB abilities. Wow, that if you sack them and come back, you make more golems. What? Rexian cookies. Yay. <laughs> so the splicers are the big ones. Blade splicer, ETBs, makes a 3 3 Phyrexian golem artifact creature token, and it says golems you control have first strike. So That's all of your tokens. Yeah, and your 3 3 is actually a 5 5, which is sick. And then if the blade splicer dies, it comes back as a 3 3 first striker that gives every golem first strike. And itself, because it's now a cookie golem. And it makes another golem because it needs to beat again. So ah. all the splicers do that. Yeah, that's going to be really good with those sack outlets, because obviously the splicers can't sack themselves, but if you can keep making golems and bringing your splicers back, then it gives you a lot of golems and a whole lot of power. Yeah. Wing splicer in particular says golem creatures you control have flying. Wow, fly little wings on all your little gingerbread cookies. That's kind of funny. Yeah, I, I think this deck wins with those trampoly buffed tokens. Yeah. Um, so giving, putting other big anthems in the deck goes a long way as well. I think Urza, Prince of Krug is pretty good in this deck. It's two white blue for a human artificer. Artifact creatures you control get plus two, plus two. Okay. Another huge anthem. And it has an activated ability that says six colon create a token that's a copy of target artifact you control, except it's a one, one soldier creature in addition to its other types. Whoa. So you can keep, he has like sort of this expensive populate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it makes it on soldier him. golem food. Food, food are the fat creature tokens sick <laughs> you probably play training grounds in this deck now that i think about it because you can reduce the food cost down to one yeah and you get urza effects cheaper too pretty cool 
Uh, this one, this one's cute and is on flavor. It's Bess Soul Nourisher. Ooh. One green and a white for a human citizen. She's got, she's also has a brew. Whenever one or more other creatures with base power and toughness, one, one, enter the battlefield under Very your control, cool. put a plus one counter on Bess. Whenever Bess attacks, each other creature you control with base power and toughness, one, one, get plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the number of plus one counters on Bess. Cool. So it's a sweet finisher and you're making a bunch of one ones and she, she like she makes cookies and your blade sure. splicers and stuff for one ones too yeah cool. really okay sweet. bernard the ginger sculptor i like the card a lot it's, it's pretty so sweet. funny and it's got a, like a really unique effect yeah and i love ginger brute it's one of my favorite cards Me ever too. i just keep putting it in decks i keep finding decks where like a one one that's hasty and unblockable is awesome yeah it just does stuff Ugh. put a sword on it this next one is one of the features of the set she's on all of the art it's ariette of the charmed apple yeah because magali villeneuve is one of the best artists ever to live oh my god this art is unbelievable quick she, shout out to magali she's launching a, a token yeah, patreon soon they're super beautiful yeah uh, we got to see her in barcelona and she's very yeah. nice yeah i found a picture of me and her from like 2018 oh yeah Pax. yeah it was her. and then her she has someone that that works with her and she was dressed as chandra and i was like oh my gosh memories i've been following magali for so long so i'm really excited for that patreon okay anyway back to the card area of the charmed apple let's read it it's one a white and a black for a human warlock two four each creature that's enchanted by an aura you control can't attack you or planeswalkers you control and at the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life where X is the number of auras you control. Okay, so it's an aura matters deck. And not only that, if you stack your auras on other people's creatures, they cannot attack you or planeswalkers. Pretty sweet. But do um, you want to be putting auras on other creatures? We'll see. What about nasty auras? Okay. What about some rude auras? There's plenty of those. And by the <laughs> way, you said you wanted to build this for Game Nights originally, right? Yeah, I really, I thought Ariette was was really, really cool. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to build this deck. Yeah. And it's tricky. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to run a lot of bad cards to do this, this kind of deck. The top effect. Yeah, to do the, to make enchant your opponent's control and get value out of it mm -hmm. uh so let's talk about some of the bad cards because that's always why i'm excited is when i get to <laughs> bad cards um there's a lot of really sweet ones ancestral vengeance is an aura for black black when it enters the battlefield you put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control but the enchanted creature gets minus one minus one Ooh, so, and then can no longer attack you or planeswalkers you control haha so there's a lot of sort of <laughs> auras that do that kind of thing yeah clawing torment enchanted artifact or creature that's kind of cool and then as long as enchanted permanent is a creature it gets minus one minus one camp block and then enchanted permanent has at the beginning of your upkeep you lose one life kill them just poke them yeah because bit. Ariat's going to poke them as well by by right. draining for the number of auras you control in a aura decks especially if you're spending cards on your opponent's creatures uh card advantage is really really important so yeah. having some of these auras that when they go to the graveyard they come back to your hand huge and despondency is one of them it's one in a black enchanted creature gets minus two minus oh and when despondency is put into a graveyard from play put it back in your hand yeah because most times you're going to enchant a creature they're like cool i can't attack you but i'm just going to swing at someone else they're going to block it and then i'm going to get rid of this negative thing that's happening to me yeah and then your card goes away and your effect goes away and you're you don't have any auras to like drain people with your commander yeah so you really just want to make sure that you always have an aura in hand i like this next one a bunch it's, i've been looking for a deck for this one forever this has to be it ragged veins one in the black enchantment aura what you could play ragged veins at any time you could play an instant whenever enchanted creatures dealt damage its controller loses that much life so if they chump block your the one one against like a ten ten, you ah, ragged veins them out take 10 yeah and you don't care about the area effect at that point you're just wanting to get them right with uh with this this ragged veins even if they you know they're blocking with an indestructible yeah like yeah, if they're yeah. blocking with a stuffy doll or i something. like this one too this one seems like one that you could actually play more in commander without area i agree i think this card's sweet it's minions return two in a black for a flash aura it has whenever enchanted creature dies return that card to the battlefield under your control Ooh, a mono black steal a creature card yeah gotta make them die first That's but uh cool. that makes them very careful with it and it yeah. can attack you so yeah yeah but hopefully you're just again casting this during combat to steal something back yeah um i will say this deck sucks against an opponent's sacrifice outlet 
This deck is sucks against a lot. <laughs> I, I swear the there's so many cool cards. Like Festering Wound is an awesome old magic card. It's one in a black for an aura. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, you may put an infection counter on Ooh. Festering Wound. The beginning of the upkeep of Enchanted Creatures Controller, Festering Wound deals X damage to that player where X is the number of infection counters on Festering Wound. That is disgusting. <laughs> It is gross. It's so yucky. And yeah, the art's really yucky. Too. And it's like it's sweet in this deck. Ugh. But yeah, it can be it can be fizzled by sacrifice out- outlets. It can be like, yeah, okay, I'll take one. I'm gonna just like keep my seedborn muse. Like Yeah, you know, who cares? It doesn't really do anything. And and area is just draining your opponents for the number of orders you control, but it's not like drawing you cards or any of that stuff. So you are already yeah. in a risky situation putting an aura on another person's creature in an even riskier situation because you're not getting card advantage as a result you're just getting some life right and what the the, the effect of that the drain is actually i think actually makes area kind of worse because mm-hmm. it means your opponents want to remove it yeah they're like you know oh, i don't like that like you know that moment in a commander game where somebody goes what's doing that <laughs> And, and you're like, it's my commander that's protecting me from all of these things. <laughs> it just, they remove it, and now yeah. all of your auras are doing nothing, yeah. and you're not draining. <laughs> I'm, I'm always just like, what's doing that? It's the, I didn't replace the battery in my fire alarm thing upstairs. That's, yeah, that's what's doing that. That's Don't what's draining ignore you. the card on the table that's doing it. <laughs> um, there is enchantment auras that are removal, though. You see these a lot in uh, standard and, and formats that want to play them, because they're efficient. Like, ossification and on thin ice, both enchant a lane, remove something, so that that's something that they can't get rid of and you got rid of something and it will add to your area add to thing. your aura count yeah this deck just wants a ton of auras and and you do want a couple that are at least like more safe than putting them on your opponent yeah so i think the top part of that card is not actually that great i think it's a bit of a trap 100 yeah. percent. And, it, and it's really good and limited because you're putting the cursed role i think on creatures right. and stuff so that at that point you are putting something on their creatures that they want to you know i'm with the cursed role is it's all in blue <laughs> Oh. I couldn't find, there was like maybe one card that put one cursed roll in black or Never white. Never mind. I know. Well, that you would, could like... Yeah. You know what also does the top part of Area's ability without having to spend all this time on other cards? Is it ghostly cards? prison? Yeah, it's a ghostly prison. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Basically but, the same effect. There are some auras that like do sort of help your opponent's things. So I think these first ones are neat but annoying and you really don't want to be annoying because yeah. you're already annoying. Yeah, it's uh, area of the charmed apple, everyone. Yeah. So you want to uh, get them with a little bit of love. Uh, so something like even just a rune of mortality. That's one in a black. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card mm-hmm. and then a chanted creature has death touch. And there's other stuff about a vehicle, but it cantrips. So it replaces itself. You get a new thing. You give their creature a little bit of a buff. And, and then, it can attack you. Yeah. And, okay. that, and now there's a little bit of benefit and you're not necessarily being like, you lose one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's kind of cool. I like that. <laughs> that's that's f- making me th- feel better about it. Spirit Link gives it uh, an interesting thing because you gain that much life, right? Yeah. It says whenever enchanted creature deals that damage you gain that much life but that has not been keyworded to lifelink so you can put it on an opponent's creature and, and now when they gain. hit <laughs> you gain the life okay which is a little annoying but at least it's not hurting them yeah 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 just uh, area second ability is. yeah angelic gift is similar to rune immortality replaces itself and gives a creature mm-hmm. flying so this is also a politicky deck now i, can I see yeah i think this. this is the direction that's a little bit um less terrifying yeah so a dead man's chest is another really cool card i've been looking for a place to put it's one in a black for an enchantment aura enchant creature and opponent controls mm. when enchanted creature dies exile cards equal to its power from the top of its owner's library you may cast spells from among those cards for as long as they remain exiled and you may spend mana as though they were many many colors or yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I you, I want, I want you draw like four or five cards when this creature dies. Yeah. Off of their library, but you know, four or five cards. I like all of the cards that say when this gets played, draw a card. Yeah. Those I, I think those are gonna be one of the better things. So yeah, Angelic Gift gives the enchanted creature flying and you draw a card. Like those just keep you turning through your deck and give you auras on the battlefield and that sort of help your opponent rather yeah. than uh, poking them in the eye repeatedly. Yep. yep. Griff's boon is cool. You can return it from the graveyard to your hand for three and a white. A flickering ward is awesome because it gives a creature protection from a color. So it could be like, hey, we have to get rid of Josh Glee Kwai. He ha- is uh, playing a mono blue deck. I'm going to flickering ward this creature be pro blue. Yeah, there you go. And then you can Gates return the flickering ward to your hand and do it somewhere else later on. Yeah. That's cool. Gives you a little bit of, of like control, a little bit of politics without being... <laughs> 
<laughs> annoying. <laughs> Super obnoxious and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, drawing a removal spell. Okay. So course, that's good. Of course, this is an enchantress deck, which yes. means we want to draw a ton of cards. Yeah. And there's a lot of cards that fortunately do that in white because yeah. um, you don't have green for enchantress, unfortunately. Yeah, but White cares about the auras, so you do have stuff like Sram, Senior Edificer. Often we play him for the drawing cards off of equipment, but he also draws off of auras. Mm -hmm. Light Paws is very good for just fetching out stuff, and you could even just stack it on your commander or whatever, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, especially if you're doing these nice things, that means you can turn the auras and put like put the flying one on your On your stuff, yeah. yeah. And yeah, now yeah. you're draining another way. Uh, Sage's Reverie, when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card for each aura you control that's attached to a creature, not this creature, oh, any okay. creature. Chanted creature gets plus one, plus one for each aura you control that's attached to a creature. So it could be real big. There you go. Um, Spirit Dancer is similar to yep. Sram drawing cards. Yay. We all love it. Hateful Eidolon is a cool one that I remember when it was in standard. I was like, I played the black, white Lurus deck oh, that it yeah, was in yeah, yeah. and it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, but I've never found a spot for it in commander and here it is. It's Hateful Eidolon, single black for an enchantment creature with lifelink. Whenever in, an enchanted creature dies, draw a card for each aura you controlled that was attached to it. Okay. Fun. Yeah. I'm having so much fun. Rachel. Are you? Mm. <laughs> Ashiox Reaper, whenever an enchantment control is put into the graveyard from the alpha, you draw a card. That's a new one from this set. The black does have like when enchantments yeah. go to the graveyard. That is a bit of a theme. Um, Same with Wicked Visitor. In this yeah. case, each opponent loses a life every time an enchantment hits the graveyard from the battlefield. Yeah. So it's a finisher, right? You're like slowly poking everyone down, hoping they swing at each other with your cool enchanted aura creatures, and then they die to you draining them out. Yeah. Of course, there's lots of aura-focused ramp. Uh, Transcendent Envoy is a classic. Uh, but one I wanted to mention, because you don't often think of it, is Killian, Ink Duelist. Oh, yeah. Great call. One in a black for a legendary human warlock with lifelink and menace. And it says, spells you cast that target a creature cost two less to cast. Nice. Or as target creatures on the stack. Hey, Although, maybe I will build this deck. I'm like, getting more interested it's, in it it's as, we, neat. as we speak. It's neat. Like, there are cards in it that I was like, this deck lets me play these really cool cards. Yeah. But if you play all these really cool cards and you have a commander that's like, everybody loses four, <laughs> and I so gain four. It. By the way, when your commander dies, now they have this, like, giant flyer yeah, that is plus. Yeah, they this thing, and like, it's coming for you. Right, well, you have the most life. You've been draining us. Whoop! Yeah, you gotta be careful. Really yeah. gotta protect Ariat. Um, well, there is some good recursion as well. Uh, you have a lot of mana value, two or less auras. So Lurus, we just spoke of, allows you to replay them. And I think you want a lot of that kind of recursion. Yeah. This next one, I can't wait to put into every deck I can. I love this card. Guardian Scale Lord. It has backup. So when it comes in the battlefield, you get to put a 1-1 one, one counter on another creature and it gains the ability of this creature. So you essentially get haste of the ability of the creature on another one that's already been there. Uh, Foreign White Flag and it says whenever this card attacks this creature attacks return target non-land permanent card with the mana value x or less from your grave to the battlefield where x is this creature's power it's like a sun titan for five mana that has a hasty sun like that has yeah. the etb basically yeah and you sun can titan. from that turn onwards swing with the guardian scale lord and right. keep using that ability get those auras back to the battlefield um auras are tricky you got to have lots and lots of recursion yeah like we said even if you're enchanting their stuff and you're like, I'm doing it. Everyone, you can't attack me. It doesn't mean they're attacking. <laughs> it doesn't mean they're necessarily Yeah, they could be like, nah, I want to block. <laughs> those creatures. I don't like, want to raise ire. Yeah, no yeah, thanks. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be attacking your opponents. So I could see this deck having a soft, like, I encourage you to attack. Oh, more reasons to hate you. <laughs> yeah, I encourage you yeah. to attack not me. Um and I'd like a Brina the Demagogue is the first one I thought of. For sure. Yeah. So whenever a player attacks one of your opponents, if that opponent has more life than another one, then the attacking player draws a card and then you get to put two 1-1 counters on creature you control. So just again, incentivizes some attacking. They could draw cards as a result. Angel's Trumpet forces creatures to not tap, but then at the end of each turn, they tap all untapped creatures that didn't attack. And then the Trumpet deals one damage to them for each creature tapped that way. Yeah. So they're going to want to swing because they all got vigilance. They all have vigilance and they won't take damage if they attack. Yeah. Uh, and they can't attack you. Uh, so that I thought Maddening Imp was a funny card to put in this deck. Uh, it's a two and a black for a, an imp. It's a one one with flying. Oh, Three mana, art. one one. Oh, all non-wall creatures. Target opponent controls. Attack this turn if able. At end of turn, destroy each one of those creatures that did not attack. Use this, <laughs> use this ability only during target opponent's turn and only before combat. So you can force them to attack. 
typically there is no protection for them to just not attack you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. But now they can't attack you with some of the stuff. Oh, I'm so I'm too back, many. There's I'm, a lot of I'm bad back cards. to not liking. There's this a lot deck. of bad yeah. cards. Uh, uh, there are a lot of cards in white that say like, "Don't attack me." Like Darien, King of Keldor, allows you to make uh, that many one ones every time you dealt damage. Mangara is yep. generally helping you in terms of combat when creatures are attacking. Yeah, I, I picture this kind of like a Brina control, like controlly yeah. politics deck, where you're like, "I'm not the problem. I'm just simply." draining you life like if her ability yeah. <laughs> said if a creature an opponent controls dies with an aura on it like you draw a card or something oh, that or, or like you gain even you gain three life oh even if it was just a strictly worse ability i think the commander would be stronger because yeah. it's not <laughs> jabbing everyone in the eyes so yeah and by a little bit and then later on when you play a bunch it just becomes a magnet for removal right and I, I i am disliking commanders more and more that just want to get removed because tough. yeah you build your whole deck around this thing and then all the crappy cards get even worse right as a result they're still fun and maybe you can politic your way out of it but when your commander hits the battlefield in this case it's like how are you going to politic your way out of draining everyone for five life every turn yeah i think this deck really <laughs> really needs like other threats that yeah. your opponents have to remove other than ariette to keep that ability going yeah like, maybe I, you could play shadrick silverquill in here and there give, you go you know yeah. do more politic and give people stuff i i can like anything that is just sort of drawing attention away from area to keep that engine going is going to be really important yeah. and obviously you could put lightning greaves or something like that on it but i like running stuff like sun titan where it's like if you would keep allowing me to have this guardian scale lord yeah i will continue to hurt you uh so you know it's a tricky one to build. If you find a better way to do that, please let me know. I really <laughs> I really do like Ariette, and I spent a lot of time trying to build her for game nights, and every time I looked at it, I was just like, Ugh. if she gets removed, I've just done nothing. I've just, yeah. I've just erased And thinking about that episode, turns. too, it would not have done no, particularly it well. No, <laughs> it, it would have been It would have been bad, been yeah. You would have so felt bad rough. about it in the long term. So we have a few more. I think we have four more commanders to talk about in this episode, uh, including some... Uh, Corvold is back. Yeah. Eldraine favorite. So stick around. But first, we've got a few words from our sponsors. Mint Mobile presents the tale of Garrick, the cursed huntsman. Garrick was once a noble collar of beasts until his will was twisted by big wireless contracts. Ah, another bill full of overcharges and surprise fees? That makes me so mad I could just kill my former allies. Oh, hi, Garrick. Ah. So Garrick wandered the plains, too strapped for cash to call his beasts. Until a simple squirrel showed him a podcast ad for Mint Mobile. What? Only 15 bucks a month for unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network? Plus, I can keep my phone and all my contacts? <clears throat> With Mint Mobile, I shall axe my accursed big wireless contract and be free to call the beast once more. Hello? Is this beasts? Yeah, I got a new plan that a squirrel showed me. Hold on, let me put you on wild speaker. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash command. That's mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. What's up, Josh? Rachel, oh, thank God. I need your help. I think I'm stuck in a time loop. What? Oh, hiring is a nightmare. Every day I wake up and I spend hours browsing job sites and searching through resumes, but it's all the same. I'm getting nowhere. That's not a time loop, Josh. That's just you not using Indeed. Instead of spending hours on multiple sites, Indeed lets you attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You'll find top talent fast with powerful tools like Instant Match. Whoa, Indeed's hiring platform is great. I literally just sponsored this job post and I already have a short list of qualified candidates. It's like Indeed did all the work for me. See? Wait, so... I'm really not in a time loop? No. Oh. Oh, God. What did you do, Josh? What did you do? Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash command zone. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash command zone. Just go to Indeed.com slash command zone and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Again, that's Indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. And then I'm going to flash out Illusory Ambusher. I will bolt it to draw three cards. I will sneak attack out Triska Decafile. I'm going to go to my upkeep, and I will win the game. 
That was your first time playing the deck? Yeah. Well, I mean, first time in paper. I've already goldfished it like a hundred times on Architect. Their playtester is super user friendly. Playing cards just takes one click and you can mulligan, tutor, and move through your turns with the press of a key. There are simple menus with counters and copies and you can take notes on cards as you play them. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. Okay, dokey, Wilds of Eldraine enjoyers. <laughs> Whoa, we uh, we're back. We're gonna talk about some more commanders. Let's kick things off with uh, Kellen the Fey Blooded. This one's a pretty simple one. It's two and a red for a legendary creature, Human Fairy. It has an adventure on it that is white, so this is a Boros Commander. Uh, the adventure side is one in the white, birthright boon for a sorcery. Search your library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. Yeah! Sweet. Tutor in the command zone. And then the creature part is two in a red, double strike, two, two. Other creatures you control get plus one, plus zero oh for each aura and equipment attached to Kellen the Fey Blooded. Sure, so, sure, sure. Boros equipment. Boros equipment go wide. Yeah, it wants you to have like a lot of creatures, but all of the equipment on Kellen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so having a tutor in the uh, command zone is pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I think looking at Kellen, I was like, Boros equipment, yeah. Um, but this is the coolest thing about Kellen is this is an opportunity to put an equipment that you like or an aura that you like in the command zone reliably. Yeah. yeah. And if there's something that you really want to build around, Kellen says, okay, yeah, you want to make a Sunforger deck? I'll Here's your you. Sunforger commander. Yeah. For two mana, no matter what, you will get your Sunforger out or and even that, an aura, yeah. right? And, and, it, and then it gives you a body to attach it to. So if you really, really you're like, I want the biggest Sunforger package. I want my whole deck to be like a fetchable Sunforger deck, yeah. by Sunforger. Then Kellen gets you that. But the thing about us telling you how to build it is there's a hundred really sweet ways to build Kellen. And all of them go in completely different directions. <laughs> yeah. So Skull Clamp says make one ones that can you're get like, clamped. All right. I'm a Boros token deck. All right. Sunforger. I'm a spell slinger Boros deck. Yeah. Helm of the Host. Oh, I'm a oh. combo-y copy deck. Okay. Uh, Reaver Cleaver says I'm doing Boros Treasures. Treasures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forge Battle Axe. Sweet. I'm Sweet. I'm Boros, send it around the table. <laughs> no, Bloodforge Battle Axe is the one that whenever a quick creature deals combat yeah, damage to a player... send it around the table. No, create a token that's a copy of Bloodforge Battle Axe. Yeah, you're sending it, you're, you're keeping your own, but you're yeah. sending the axe around the Why table. Why are you, right? you're not sending this axe anywhere. Well, you're kind of sending it by giving, giving them a token copy. You're, you're not giving the, the, you get it. Oh, you get it. You're sending the damage around the table. <laughs> I was thinking about the other one. Plus he has double strike. So if you put the Blood Forge Battle Axe on him, then he hits, you make a token copy, and he hits, hits. and you make another token copy. Yeah, then you sweet. put all those Battle Axes on Kellen, and then you make three, and then you make three again. Wow. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, and obviously you're going to want to put the swords in there. Anything that hits does stuff is always great with double strike creatures. Yeah, I... I like the idea of just picking an, a, like, an equipment that you really like and being like, okay, what are all the things that are really good with like Pariah's Shield, which is a, oh. an <laughs> equipment that people really love. It says all damage that would be dealt to you is dealt to equipped creature instead. Yeah. Make it indestructible and go nuts. Yeah. Now you've got Do a something. stuffy doll brush taunter deck. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, that's really built around like redirecting damage. Um, one that I thought was kind of cool and a lot of people wouldn't think of is Hand of Vecna. Mm. Do you remember this thing in Limited? I do. It was interesting. It was a house. I mean, this is a three-mana equipment that says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, equipped creature or a creature you control named Vecna gets <laughs> plus happening. X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of cards in your hand. Whoa, it's going to be big. So huge buff. And then it says... Equip is pay one life for each card in your hand or equip two. Kind of like a free equip. It's kind of, yeah. Life, you right? can pay life. So if you, you tutor for Hand of Vecna, you cast your commander on three. Then on four, you cast Hand of Vecna, equip it for free, and you swing with this huge thing. Yeah, it's thing like plus five, plus five or whatever. Immediately so with double strike. Yeah, seven, seven double striker. And then you're just building Boros card draw and trying to keep your hand as big as possible. Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. you're doing Vecna stuff. I don't know. I don't know what you're into. Yeah, maybe this is the deck that you also play all of the Cauldra equipment, which are sweet because the Helm of Cauldra says, pay one mana if you control equipment named Helm of Cauldra, Sword of Cauldra, and Shield of Cauldra. Put a 4-4 colorless Avatar Legend creature token named Cauldra into play and attach all those equipment to it. So you built a boy. You did it. You played the Cauldra deck. 
And in that deck, you probably just cast the tutor for two, send it back to the command zone, cast the tutor for four, yeah. send it back to the command zone. Or just play a bunch of the tutors for equipment that we'll talk about here that in just a second. Too. Of course, if you're building around one piece and it is not in your command zone, you're going to need a lot of recursion for it. Yeah. Uh, I really like the new card Forge Anew. It's two and a white for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, return target equipment from your graveyard to the battlefield. Very good. As long as it's your turn, you may activate equip abilities anytime you could cast an instant. And you may pay zero rather than paying the equip cost of the first equip ability you activate during each of your turns. Yeah, this is the Sunforger deck for, for sure. sure because the Sunforger costs so much to equip and everyone's going to want to be blowing that thing up ASAP and you want to be unequipping it. So that seems really good in this deck. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, similar, Danitha Benalia's Hope allows you to put an aura equipment from your hand or graveyard on the battlefield attached to Danitha when she enters the battlefield. Immediately equipped. It's also just a first strike vigilance lifelinker, She's which is huge. huge yeah. Uh, Master of Ingenuity is an equipment that enters as a copy of an equipment on the battlefield. Uh, so if you're like Colossus Hammer. Double Colossus Hammer Sweet. on the 2-2 two, two double striker. I'll Seems take it. Good. Um, okay, what if you want to build around the aura? It's tough to find an aura that I was like, oh, this is cool to build around. Yeah. Uh, the first one I thought of was Splinter Twin. Yeah, that's a very good one. Uh, which uh, enchanted creature has tap, put a token that's a copy of this creature onto the battlefield. That token has haste, exile at the beginning of the next end step. So obviously not your commander, but yeah. you do it for something else, but you just get Splinter Twin, which seems pretty good. Yeah, there's a lot of infinite combos, but there's also some cool stuff that you could just do with other creatures. There are the curses as well. Curse of Obsession, four and a red enchant player. At the beginning of enchant player's draw step, that player draws two additional cards. Whoa! At the beginning of the enchant player's end step, that player discards their hand. Neat! Like a red white storm brew. I don't know. Yeah. There's some like madness. Uh, Shifting Shadow is a really cool aura that came out in Neon Dynasty. Oh, yeah. Two and a red for an aura. An enchant creature. Enchanted creature has haste. And at the beginning of your upkeep, destroy this creature. You reveal are cards correct. from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card. Put that card onto the battlefield and attach Shifting Shadow to it. Then put all cards revealed this way on the bottom of your library in random order. Okay, so this also could be tutor up the next only creature in my deck. You could go find one creature or yeah. it could help you chain through your deck and hit a whole bunch of creatures in whatever order uh shifting it shadow is, is just like a neat cool. aura that is a, a neat deck building idea okay how do you win with this deck i was like okay cool if you let's say you want to go competitive kellen yeah uh, in that case you have a bunch of tutors yeah. in these colors stoneforge mystic tajnar swordsmith stone hero giant enlightened tutor steel shepherd's gift imperial recruiter recruiter of the guard can get you the stoneforge mystic right mm. uh so you tutor something up you can tutor up pretty much anything you want including well any equipment or aura right and then you just have so many infinite combos in this type of deck oh my gosh helm of the host and godo is one that you can Classic. just right you can play for instance shifting shadow to get godo to get helm of the host and win you can play aurelia the war leader as well with helm of the host comet celebrant kiki jiki port razor scourge of the throne aki bow squad breath of fury are all infinite combos with helm of the host mm -hmm. you can play nim death mantle and then astronaut's altar and then you get infinite enter the battlefield and leaves the battlefield trigger so you can play an impact tremors deck yeah uh, elemental mastery works with splinter twin sunstrike legionnaire there you go yeah you can get splinter twin go infinite yep sword of feast and famine and then you if you have enough mana you could hellkite charger over and over again or aggravated assault or you could do like a thornbite staff kiki jiki deck so tons and tons of equipment that go infinite with creatures in your deck so it, yeah. having a tutor in the command zone is as powerful as you want it to be yeah so you could actually play i think this could potentially have some cdh potential yeah i mean maybe just because like, it's a tutor in the command zone right it's pretty yeah. good Godo, Godo's a CDH viable thing. Maybe this is just Godo plus white. Yeah. I don't know enough about CDH to... Me neither. To know, but But see. thanks for listening to cool. The Command Zone, where we are experts on CDH, and we like to gloat about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would just say for Kellen, though, anytime you have a red-white equipment deck, this card goes in it. Yeah, these kind of tutors are great. Plus, it's an overrun on it if you're running a ton of equipment yeah. or a ton of auras. Yeah, yeah. And it just, it by itself, having double strike makes it a good thing to equip stuff sure. onto. So if you're in a, like, let's say you're completely out of cards, you draw Kellen, you're the happiest camper in the world. Yeah, now you have a tutor for the equipment you want and the creature, creature. to put it on. Yeah. 
it's a uh, a lot of ways to build Kellen. I want to. I'm excited to see how people build it, what it or is and equipments people are excited to build around. All right, let's talk about everyone's least favorite dragon. He's back and he's big, Corvold, gleeful, glutton. He's been snacking. He and has been suddenly snacking. an eight drop, five black, red, green for a legendary dragon noble. He's a four four. This spell costs one less to cast for each card type among permanents you've sacrificed this turn okay uh flying trample haste very Whoa. powerful whenever corvold deals combat damage to a player put x plus one plus one counters on corvold and draw x cards where x is the number of permanent types am- uh, among cards in your graveyard so cool so corvold is snacking on stuff you're sacrificing stuff and yeah. when it deals damage it's going to snack even harder and draw cards draw more cards based on what's in your snack. graveyard yeah um yeah it's like a weird corvold delirium deck yeah like it cares about the number of the creature the card types in your graveyard yeah on both sides it's all it's basically like corvold's like the more different things i eat the easier it will be for me to come me out to kill. yeah it's, yeah. it's but it has it's, to be different this is they're all lands i don't care <laughs> this is a uh, corvold kirby style kirby right? style like yeah snacks something and turns into it um okay so your commander is eight mana you have to figure out how to get this guy on the battlefield and the way that you do it is by sacking cards with either multiple card types or multiple cards with different, different card, card types. types. Um, the easiest, of course, to sacrifice are going to be artifacts, lands, and creatures. Yeah. The other options are enchantments and planeswalkers, battles. Yeah, very hard. Uh, difficult to sacrifice a battle. Yeah. There are ways to do it. A little more ways to do it, but I think really you're going to go for creature, land, and artifact Art- artifact yeah. yeah you could so, sack a treasure or something so yeah you'll get corvold from eight mana down to five but then you'll smack someone and draw probably three form cards yeah it depends on what is in your graveyard i mean it, it feels like you want stuff in this deck that sacrifice itself for free mm-hmm. because you're also trying to cast your you know likely five drop commander and are non-token permanents that sack themselves. So that you get the second So that you can, you yeah, more. you can draw more cards off of it. Yeah, but a treasure is a very good way because it will yeah. pay for one mana and make for Corvold to be a little smaller. Absolutely. Um, okay, so fetch lands are great, especially yeah. ones that allow you to get lands that enter the battlefield untapped because then you can use that mana to then pay for Corvold. Yeah, you really, really have to save your fetches for when Corvold comes down so you can reduce uh, the land slot of yeah. Corvold. So you're running every fetch that fetches relevant lands in your deck. I even think this deck could want Sandstone Needle uh, and and the Depletion Cycle. Uh, so these are the ones that enter with two Depletion Counters and then tapped, and then they tap for two mana. Mm-hmm. And they go to the graveyard afterward. Urza's Saga is a great land because if you plan on playing Corvold the land that it sacrifices itself, you can get a Soul Ring and then tap that for two. And then Urza Saga, you can also tap for a mana. Yeah. So you'll get three mana right there to play Corvold. Plus, Urza Saga is both an enchantment and a land. So wow. it counts for sacking two permanents. Yeah, because sacrificing an enchantment is not very easy. It's not, especially for free. Yeah, this set, though, has a lot of ways to sack enchantments. So if you w- did play a couple of those, that would help, obviously, for Corvold. Yeah, for Corv- sure. Uh, I could also see running stuff like Ashaya, Soul of the Wilds, that turns all of your creatures into lands. Oh, so if you sack them? Then they count for two permanents. Cool. So you're sacking fewer permanents. Uh, Awaken the Woods also makes token creature lands. So gotcha. sacking those tokens would count for two card types. Yeah, also Urza Saga counts as an enchantment land in the graveyard too. So then Dryad yeah. Arbor would count as a creature land in the graveyard. Yeah. Anything that you can play that has multiple permanent types yeah. is going to be really, really good in this deck. Yeah. And if you don't want to hold your fetches, then you'll play your Crucible of Worlds and Raymond Up Excavators. This is a Jun deck, so you already kind of can go that route, mm-hmm. you know? That's kind of nice. Yeah, for sure. Giving you access to your fetch lands over and over again. And if you're running a ton of fetch lands, just running a, a value Raymond app is actually great. Yeah, totally. 
Okay, so sacrificing artifacts, there's lots of ways to do it. Obviously, treasures are going to be a really, really good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, And anything like a lotus petal in particular is a very good version of a treasure. Right. Because you can sack the lotus petal and then the lotus petal lives in your your graveyard graveyard, and and you can use the mana. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I also looked for things that sacrificed creature artifacts. So they counted for two of the the types. Yeah. So something like gold hound, which is a treasure dog. Yeah, I love this card. It's just a one mana red for a striker that uh, can tap and sack to make you a treasure yeah. mana, basically. It but it's an artifact creature. It's an artifact creature in your graveyard. It counts as two, and it gives you mana to cast Corvold. Yeah, I also like the inclusion of Liquid Metal Torque here because you can use it to make something an artifact and then sacrifice it, and it counts for the first part of Corvold's cast ability, not for the second. But it count, when you sack it, it's like, oh, that was an artifact creature. Now you sacked because you it was a liquid metal torqued. Yeah, I anything that you can do to like stack a ton of card types onto one thing that you sacrifice mm-hmm. is gonna go a long way. Uh, I think Oni Cult Anvil is very good in decks like this. It's black red for an artifact. Whenever one or more artifacts you control leave the battlefield during your turn, create a one one colorless construct artifact creature token. This ability triggers only once each turn. Nice. But it's also a sack outlet for artifacts. It's tap sack an artifact deals one damage to each opponent you gain one life yeah it's really nice because it can get its own self going right you just need to make one of those little one ones and then you can start sacrificing yeah you could even sacrifice the oni cult to itself oh make the creature and then have an artifact in your graveyard if you really really need a sacrifice a thing any artifact that sacks itself is going to be great. The Jeweled Lotus is obviously incredible in this deck, oh, as it yeah. often is. Um, but that will get your core rolled onto the battlefield nice and quick. Okay, cool. Let's talk about uh, enchantments. Yeah. Sacking enchantments is a little <laughs> trickier, especially for free. Um, Seal of Primordium is a really good option in this deck. It's one in a green for an enchantment that says sacrifice it, destroy target artifact or enchantment. Cool. So you do have to, that's the only issue. Is you have to time it. Yeah. yeah. You have to hope that on the turn you want to cast Corvold that you're going to be able to want something to kill something. Same goes for Haywire Might, which was a artifact creature. Mm-hmm. You have to be like, cool, I need to use this right now and then be able to cast Corvold for a little cheaper. So one that I think is great in the deck is Gaia's Touch. Ooh. This is a card I like a lot. It's yeah, an enchantment for green, green. It says you may play an additional land during your turn if that land is a basic forest. Then sacrifice Gaia's Touch, add green, green to your mana pool. Oh, very cool. So that's technically three mana towards Corvold. Green, green from this and then sacking an enchantment to make it cost one less. Yeah. And if you have a basic forest in play, uh, you can play whatever land as your first land drop and then your second land drop can be that basic forest. Oh. So you can get a little bit of value out of it before it goes to the that's graveyard. That's sweet. Yeah. Bitter Reunion seems really good here too. It comes down as one in a red to discard a card and draw two and then you can pay one to sack it and give your creatures haste until end of turn. So again, just cheap to sacrifice actually kind of pays for itself so you kind of want other creatures to give haste you know on a later turn or whatever because corval does have haste yeah it it can count towards like you just an enchantment in the graveyard but and by the way yeah. later on when corval costs more to cast if you have to play it more than once then bitter reunion looks even better yeah i i like lampad of death's vigil and i i wasn't sure about this card it, it's one in a black for an enchantment creature nymph it's a one three it says one sacrifice a creature each opponent loses one life and you gain one life okay and it's not a free sack outlet so we often like look down on those because there's so many free sack yeah. outlets that are really, really good. Um, but the fact that this is an enchantment creature that can either sack itself for two, two. Tri- two triggers and a drain, or it can sack something else and just be a sack outlet in your, your sacrifice deck. Too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Plus it's a little win con. Like it, it's not a huge drain, but it does kind of a lot pretty well. It doesn't do a lot great. Yeah. But it does a, a lot of the things that you want it to do. Yeah, it's got um, like three different applications to the deck all in right. one. Which is great, by the way, because when you're using a commander that draws you like three cards when you attack with it, mm-hmm. you're okay playing slightly lower power cards that are synergy based. Right. Unbridled Growth is an amazing card for this deck. It's green for an enchantment aura. It gives an enchant land, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Fixing and you can just ramp. sack it to draw a card. Easy. 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 For free. Easy. For free. Easy. Second Creatures is obviously pretty easy in Commander, um, but there are some cool ones that are non-token creatures that put a creature card in your graveyard. Obviously, Sakura Tri-Builder is a real champ, yep. but something like a Wild Cantor, which is a single mana, it's either red or green mana, 
For a 1-1, it says, Sacrifice Wild Canter, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Nice. You can pay for it on turn one or turn two, and then you can sack it later and it'll pay for Corbold. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Blood Pet is similar. What's that engine? There's like a red one that gives the creature haste. That's like one in a red to play. I forget the name of it, but it's a very similar thing. There are creatures that sacrifice themselves that give you mana, either yeah. equal or sometimes even more. Yeah. There, oh yeah, by the way, there is bargain in this set. So yeah. there is a dragon that will allow you to bargain out and add mana, but cards that bargain will allow you to sacrifice tokens or enchantments and stuff, and that will obviously push Corval down a little faster. Tinder Wall is doing, it does a similar thing that uh, we were talking about. You sacrifice it and you add red red to your mana pool, but it's a green creature with defender. Very nice. Uh, you could also sacrifice it and deal two damage to target creature if it's blocking. <laughs> that costs you red to do it. So uh, <laughs> don't do that. It'd be, it, it, you're probably just sacking it for mana. <laughs> yeah. Um, Awakening Zone uh, gives you little Eldrazi tokens that you sack to add a mana. So again, when you do that with Corvold, you already get one reduction from the creature and then one from the creature itself. So they're kind of like little soul rings almost. Okay. Cute. The, the other permanents are very difficult to to sacrifice. There's not a lot of ways to sacrifice planeswalkers. There's certainly not a lot of ways to sacrifice battles. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. I like the only planeswalker that I was like, maybe this card goes in the deck is Vraska Golgari Queen because it has a tick up ability that says you may sacrifice another permanent. Okay. If you do, you gain one life and you draw a card. So it sacrifices any kind of permanent. So you can do lands that aren't fetch lands. Yes. Yeah. It could be battles. You can't sacrifice Vraska to herself. Oh, another permanent. Yeah. But if you have other planeswalkers, I don't hey, do don't do not sacrifice planeswalker. Don't do that. Don't yeah. uh, unless it is enchanted with something horrible. Don't don't sacrifice a planeswalker. Yeah. Um, I don't think you do that. It is a sack deck, so hypothetically, you want sack outlets. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is this deck wants to sacrifice a ton of different types of cards, and there aren't a lot of sack outlets that allow you to sack whatever you want yeah most often it's creatures yeah uh, claws of gix is going to be the best example it's a zero man artifact that says one sacrifice a permanent colon you gain one life and what claws of gix is for is just sacking something yeah uh it doesn't really do <laughs> planeswalkers anything you could sacrifice your planeswalker Battles. probably don't uh to make your commander cost one less yeah um, but in a sacrifice deck, it'll sacrifice any of the permanents you want off the battlefield. Yeah, same goes for Tavern Scoundrel, and you flip coins, and if you win those coin flips, you make treasures, which is kind of cool. Um, and then you have like my one of my favorite cards, Greater Gargadon, which sits in the Suspend Exile Zone, and you can sack an artifact creature or land to it. So it's pretty multi-use for a sack deck. I think Greater Gargadon is sneaky great in a number of decks. I used yeah, to run I it my Atla Polani deck, and it oh, was a yeah. house. Party time. Uh, there are a lot of ways to sacrifice creatures, of course, especially creatures to make mana, which is a theme of what, we, what we've been talking about. Burnt Offering and Cull the Weak both sacrifice a creature and make a lot of mana. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they give you a sort of uncounterable sack effect. You could get that same sack effect on Phyrexian Tower, which is a land. Yeah. And then you also just have cards that are sack for value. Mm-hmm. So there's like Deadly Dispute. There's a whole bunch of cards that sacrifice a creature and then you draw cards as a result. Um, Diabolic Intent is a tutor. So mm-hmm. if you just happen to be, and now you're assuming that you have a lot of mana because you're paying extra mana to get like a cost reduction of one maybe on right. Corval. And at that point, it's like, you know what? I've got a bunch of mana generation. I'm in Jund, very powerful colors. I don't care so much about making Corvold as cheap as possible and focusing so much on that. I just want to grab a card, draw some cards, make Corvold a little cheaper maybe, or or mitigate the cost of my Diabolic Intent, and then be able to play Corvold on the same turn, swing, do even more. Right, and just get stuff into your graveyard so you're drawing even more cards with your commander. Uh, I like Deadly Dispute in particular because it makes treasure tokens. You can yeah. sack a creature and it oh, makes treasure. treasure. Yeah. And then sack, get the treasure. Anyway. We process. This card's sweet. Two black black sour sorcery. Sacrifice any number of artifacts, creatures, and or lands. Draw a card for each permanent sacrifice this way. It's such a it's such a gutsy card, yeah. and in a deck that just wants to sacrifice all of its stuff to draw more cards, uh, reprocess is exactly what you want. <laughs> yeah, and maybe you play like Grave Pact and stuff in this deck. Yeah, I hate prob- telling people to play. Don't I don't play Grave Pact. It sucks. <laughs> Stick to the Verbos then. Don't don't play that either. It's but you're I don't, sacrificing it's not, stuff and then win you're the game instead. Huge- you are by making no. everyone miserable. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely want stuff that like you sacrificing stuff like yeah. Grave Pact type effects like Mazarek, Crawl, Death Priest says whenever a player sacrifices another permanent, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. Yay! It's Maybe you love Corval, the original. 
Yeah. When you sack a permanent, you put a 1-1 counter on Corval and draw a card. You probably still play the original Corval and put the new one in here. Because yeah. if you're building too much around the new one, I think it's really tough. The If you're building around this one, the best card in your deck is going to be Baba Lizaga, uh Night Witch. She's one black and a green for a human warlock. It says, tap, sacrifice up to three permanents. If there were three or more card types among the sacrifice permanents, each opponent loses three life and you gain three life. Oh. You draw three cards. Perfect card so this deck. So this deck is Baba Lizaga with red, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think if you like Corvold and you like what he's doing, you should probably just build Baba Lizaga. She's Instead, a sack outlet. Yeah, it's yeah, way yeah. cleaner. And I know you want red. I know you do. But... It's so much tidier. <laughs> yeah. This card. And it's a three man card. That yeah. Is people don't realize how cr- scary and crazy it gets often. And so you're able to actually do stuff with yeah, it. Yeah. Baba Lizaga is really, really neat. Yeah. Um, but now that you have red, you can play Mayhem Devil, which deals one damage to any target whenever you, a player sacrifices a permanent. So you're going to be doing a lot of that. I really like old Rutstein in this deck, and he often feels slow, but I think he does enough here. It's one black green for yeah. a human peasant. When he enters the battlefield or at the beginning of your upkeep, mill a card. Great. You want stuff in your graveyard. If it's a land card, you make a treasure. Great. If a creature card is milled this way, create a 1-1 one, one insect creature token. Great. Mm. If a non-creature, non-land card is milled this way, make a blood. Great. Blood. A blood token. Gives you lots of stuff to sacrifice to trigger your commander and also cards in your yeah, graveyard. Yeah, filling that stuff up is really nice. I really like uh, self mill when it comes to like Stitcher Supplier mm. or Dragon's Rage Channeler is really good because you just get so many surveil triggers off it. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of my favorites of all time is Old Stick Fingers. Yeah, Old Rutstein, Old Stick Fingers. They're all the same. They're I all old. cannot wait to build a deck where they're all old. They, <laughs> they keep making these cards, and they're all in yeah. They're Bulgari. all black green, and they're all old. Something. Old stick fingers. Yeah, there's old fogey. That old silver border Ooh, card. Yeah. And again, you're in Jun, so you probably do a bunch of graveyard stuff, reanimate, um, stitch together, and far wanderings have threshold, so they care about having a lot of cards in your graveyard. This is the kind of deck that is doing that, both with mill and sacrificing. So it seems pretty good. And again, you have card advantage. You're gonna get a lot of cards you're gonna probably even maybe discard cards in this deck so they all seem pretty good we have been talking about a lot of cards in order to get your commander into play just to get him on the battlefield (laughs) and once he's here he does do stuff but i i wonder if if like we've been saying uh this corvold is just too many hoops i think it's uh, you probably have to just be very careful and you have sack synergies for the front side to cast it but you don't build around that entirely because again corval just coming down even as like a six mana commander so you just get two reduction on yeah. it and then drawing you three cards or whatever yeah. is good enough and putting three counters on it yeah yeah that is a lot of card draw I think I could see this being like I you have a Corvold deck your playgroup doesn't want to play against it anymore so you build have, new Corvold you, I built him but like you you have this card in the ninety nine and if you want to play a slightly lower power oh, or you, you, switch you, it you out. can switch your Corvold yeah that's cool and make him a little bit more expensive and still keep a lot of this energy yeah this is like you know how they will do the planeswalkers in like the intro decks that cost six mana yeah, seven this is mana ridiculous. this is like that Corvold Jace Light yeah it's like oh it does all the things Corvold does but technically. Not, but just, <laughs> Yeah, you can't really cast it for the same amount of mana and it's still powerful it is still very powerful you just gotta get him here yeah i actually like that a lot take your corval deck put the new one in there and if you're playing against people that really hate old corval just show them new corval just be like hey this hey. one also sacks stuff and draws cards yeah. it's fun and it's then they're junk. gonna be like wait i still hate this one you're like oh, oh you won't hate this next one although you are gonna sack some stuff it's so ginger the meal ender yeah a two mana legendary artifact creature food knight she's a three one uh sir ginger has trample hexproof <laughs> and haste as long as your opponent controls a planeswalker you could just pretty much ignore that text. ignore that uh whenever an artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield put a plus one plus one counter on sir ginger and scry one cool also has the food text but supercharged just two tap sacrifice sir ginger you gain life equal to its power so it already is a three one so it's going to at the very least give you three life like regular food but yep. the text we care about is Putting artifacts in the graveyard, get a 1-1 counter, and scrying one. There's a lot of ways to put artifacts in the graveyard, Jimmy Wong. We are in colorless, however. That is so true. So you don't have as many, but there's still a ton. There's there's still a ton. Um, and you know what the first thing that you need to make a good cookie? Eggs. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. If you're ever baking and you're making a cake and you don't have eggs, 
Ugh. Yeah, like your it, it just lotus petals. Pretty bad. Yeah, a lotus <laughs> petal. That's an egg. That's an egg. Yeah, so eggs. You're referring to an yeah. old deck type where it's you're basically <laughs> you know you're sacking stuff and getting a bunch of value from putting stuff in the graveyard. Yada yada. Eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Eggs and eggs. cookies. Get it? It was a really good pun. Thank you. Don't make cookies and bake things without eggs unless you're trying to go the vegan route. It is really hard to replicate what eggs do in the baking recipe. Eggs are important. Okay, back to the actual podcast. Uh, of course, the token eggs that we all know and love are treasures. Um, I could definitely see this deck just being sort of a, a tchotchke deck that we talked about. Tchotchke you make a ton eggs. of clues and food and treasures and you sack them all to make your commander really, really big. Um, Scribe on Tray. Yeah. Not draw. You're just crying. Just crying. Uh, good, because there's a lot of ways to make treasures. Yeah. Treasure Vault is a land that when you sacrifice it to make treasure tokens also triggers your commander because it's an artifact land. Kind of yep. cool. Uh, I like Treasure Map a lot. It's two mana artifact. It says one tap scry one, which we love in this deck. <laughs> Clearly. Put a landmark counter on Treasure Map. Then if there are three or more landmark counters on it, remove those counters, make three treasures and flip it. And the backside says tap, sack a treasure, draw a card. Yeah. So you're going to draw and scry, which is kind of cool. Actually, I think you get to order the scry first. Because it is yeah. your treasure getting sacrificed is for the ability trigger. is going to trigger Sir yeah. Jinja. Noble's Purse enters the battlefield, tap with three coin counters on it, and you remove a coin counter and you create a treasure token. I like this next one uh, a lot in in my Eloise deck. It's Ceremonial Knife. This is a one mana equipment that says equip creature gets plus one plus zero and has whenever this creature deals combat damage, create a blood token. Ooh. Equip two deals combat damage. To a creature, to a player, to a battle, to a planeswalker, doesn't oh, matter. Oh, even in combat. Damage. Uh, yes. So as long as you're in combat, you're going to make a blood token. And what I like about the bloods is that scry first. Yeah. Uh, because you're going to sacrifice the blood token. You get the scry. And then you, if you want it, you immediately get that card off of the top. Yeah. Uh, and you discard a card, but that's some really, really solid selection. And uh, you get that sack trigger for an extra counter. Yeah, I think that's really important that you do want to draw cards in this deck because just scrying a bunch of times is not going to get you there. Yeah. Which is oven allows you to set creatures to make food tokens, which is a little sad because you're making more you foods. Cook your cookies. Yeah, you can't cook the already cookie. You could cook something else in the deck. Um, if you're making any kind of tokens, specifically clues, foods, or treasures, sorry, not any kind, then you want Academy Manufacturer. This won't be the last time we talk about this card this episode. Yeah, that's true. If you create a clue, food, or treasure, you instead make one of each. Yeah, it gives you just more stuff to sack to make your commander even bigger and just keep scrying. Yeah, this is definitely a Voltron deck. It's yeah, it's about Voltron. it's about getting your commander really big, and you can do all of this at instant speed, right? You can wait until post blocks and be like, "Do you want a block? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want a block? I could sack all these treasures and make it really big and kill whatever you block. Like, oh, you know what? Uh, no blocks. All right, I'll go. sack three. Yeah. Make it a six three. I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna scry a bunch of times. Yeah, because I got. Yeah. yeah, so you're sneaking some damage through each time. Um, yeah, you got your Mind Stone, your Brain Stone, Mishra's Bobble, Lotus Petal, all yeah. instant speed abilities. Those are our more typical eggs. Yeah. Uh, eggs. Like eggs, by definition. Okay, uh, mono colors. What can we do? A lot, actually. Mono, what? Sorry, mono color by being colorless. Is colorless, color. yeah. Uh, <laughs> mono colorless. Uh. Artifacts sort of famously combo with the graveyard. Yeah. Um, starting with one Scrap Trawler. Mirror Retriever. Yeah, these uh, are all artifacts that want to, that care about artifacts going to the graveyard mm -hmm. and then want to bring them back. Yeah, so when Mirror Retriever dies, you go get one. Strap Trawler says whenever anything dies, you go get something from the graveyard. Junk Diver says when it dies, you return stuff from the graveyard. And this deck is all about sacking stuff, getting it back, replaying the thing, sacking it to draw. I think this is just more of an artifact combo deck, and you've got this... Random free this, one that can murder this, someone. Yeah, this murder cookie in the command zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually really funny. I like that a lot. And if all things go badly and you can't attack, you sack it and gain like 20 life or whatever. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> that that's sort of the thing is like there are where well, I guess we can jump ahead a little, a little bit. You definitely want sack out list for all your artifacts. Arcbound Ravager and is Kruk particularly Klan good. Clan Ironworks. And Kruk Clan Ironworks. Uh, of course, we've mentioned KCI. So let's get into infinite combos. Yeah, anytime you're playing Kruk Clan Ironworks, uh, you have a bunch of ways to just win the game with infinite combos. Mm -hmm. So Nim Deathmantle we talked about earlier. Um, you can put cards like Worm Coil Engine or Mirror Battle Sphere, cards that give you more artifacts. And then Nim Deathmantle lets them come back to the battlefield. Then you can sack them to Kruk Clan Ironworks or Ashnaut's Altar, make more mana, bring it back, pay for that thing, get more stuff, and just have infinite creatures, infinite enters the battlefield effects. 
Yada yada. It's like infinite creatures, infinite mana. You're also going to make your commander infinitely big, big, which sacks to gain you infinite Infinite life. life. Ah, yes. Uh, There are many, many ways to pay off this sort of sack loop that you can create with name death mantle or with just anything with modular. If you pile all those counters onto your commander and then you kill your commander and move all those counters onto walking ballista with like the Ozolith oh, or yeah. something, that's a payoff. Or just have infinite man to pump into walking ballista. That's true. You've, you've already made infinite mana. You infinite have life. Thanks to your commander sacking itself. Ether flux reservoir. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually, I think, yeah, it's either you're going straight, I'm going to make this thing huge, put a bunch of cool equipment in here, my little ginger brute is mm. murdering you, or you go for some shenanigans that get you infinite something, and then you find an alternate win con there. Yeah, I I think this is, it's going to be very hard to do like an artifact sack deck that doesn't go infinite without some of the really key pieces that make yeah. an artifact sack deck work. Um, you know, like Scrap Trawler, like KCI, like like these, these things just... You really, really want them in the deck, and they really, really go infinite. Uh, they just <laughs> yeah. do. They just figure out a way. <laughs> You're like, hey, you got a lot of mana. So be prepared for that if you are doing that kind of build. But you could also do a more plus one, plus one counter focused build uh, using modular and our friend, the Ozolith. Yep. So Ozolith moves counters off when the creature dies and puts them right back on. Um, so you just make Surge Ginger huge, and every time Surge Ginger comes back out, get scared because you got your Swift Foot Boots or your Lightning Greaves, and they can just one shot someone. Oh yeah, um, uh, or you can even just play like your ginger brute and then move the counters onto that, and then that one shot someone because it's unblockable. Block. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you can think in this deck. You think about your commander as like a counter generator. Mm-hmm. Like she produces all of the counters when you're sacrificing stuff, and then you're moving it onto something that has more natural evasion. Yeah, or you could give it, you know, like a whisper silk cloak or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Marthas Ghostfire Initiate seems pretty sweet in this deck because. You're going to want to put 1-1 counters on Sir Ginger, and that's going to put 1-1 counters on Amarthus, and then eventually when Amarthus dies, you got to put all those manifests onto the battlefield. That's kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, give you a whole bunch of creatures, uh, which is another way you could close out the game. Commander's Plate is great evasion in a colorless deck. That's you right. You have no colors, therefore you have protection from all the colors. Yeah, so this is when Solemn Simulacrum all of a sudden becomes the best creature on the game. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're like, hey, it can block. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Uh, my favorite piece of evasion that you could put on your commander is golden gilded pinions. Oh, yeah, this is funny. It's a two mana equipment that says equipped creature has flying and equipped two, but it also ETBs and makes a treasure token. So Good you could sacrifice commander. and put a commander, uh, a counter. counter on your yeah. commander and then give it flying. Yeah, Shadow Spear is pretty sweet. Giving it trample and lifelink seems really important when you're making a huge Surge Ginger. Yeah, I mentioned oh. it briefly, but this is going to be a modular deck if you're doing colorless and you're moving plus one plus one counters around yeah we're not going to mention all the modular cards we mentioned a lot of them when we were talking about omarthus uh so if you're really into doing the colorless deck please go check out or you can check out the eldrazi unbound upgrade that with, one uh ashlyn right yeah ashlyn came in and, and gave show shared her colorless ways um the ways this is the way yeah, but you're definitely going to want all of the colorless sea staples that we mentioned in there. Mystic Forge, Ugin, the Ineffable. All this kind of dust. Thing. Yeah. <sighs> really, really powerful and yeah. make sacrificing all of the colors worth it in a way. Yeah. I mean, colorless decks are now as powerful as colored decks sometimes. Yeah. And they tend to have a ton of like dedicated ramp strategy and right. a lot of synergy. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Especially if you're playing whatever that crazy new one that is all the Eldrazi in one spell. God. Yeah, the the extra turns. Bomb. Yeah, extra turns, exiling, it does everything. All three of the, yeah. the Eldrazi's. Okay, yep. um, cool. That is Sir Ginger. I like that a bit, very but not silly. a lot. Yeah. It's very silly. Um, but I think if you do play it, you can find a lot of ways to win. Similar to like Kellen, right? It's like if you want to just get degenerate and just go straight infinite, then you can. You absolutely can. All right, last it's one. One final commander. It's the honk goose mother. It's more like honk, 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 honk. Yeah, it, there's actually uh, six individual heads, so that's six honks for an X green blue tutu with flying bird hydra. Goose mother enters the battlefield with X one one counters on it. When the goose mother enters the battlefield, create half X food tokens. Round it up. Whenever the goose mother attacks, you may sacrifice a food. If you do, draw a card. It's kind of like hydroid crisis. Kind of. But it's a goose. And the art's by Jesper. Nice job, Jesper. Always does the best job. 
Uh, we've been talking a lot about food lately uh, because it was in Lord of the Rings. It was heavily represented in one of the pre-cons. So a lot of those cards go in this deck as well. Yep. Uh, the Shire says tap an untapped creature you control, make a food. Revive the Shire makes uh, returns a permanent from a graveyard to your hand and you make a food. Uh, but of course, food is famous, uh, f- famously came from Eldrain. They invented food. Uh, <laughs> and so Before then, planeswalkers would eat nothing. Nothing. But uh, loyalty. Yeah, and this Blainswalker certainly made us fear the food. It's Oko, Thief of Crowns. Yeah, Oko's the food maker. Uh, yeah, that's what we good. know him for. It's making food. Making food, <laughs> not any of the other stuff. This could be like a mystical creature's deck. You're making elk with, with Oko. You got a goose mother as your commander. Um, Tireless Provisioner is very good. It's landfall. Create a food or treasure token. And then you play Academy Manufacturer in this deck, obviously, as well. That is, You have Academy Manufacturer on three. You cast the Goose Mother for two. You make a food clue and treasure when it enters the battlefield. Yikes. Yeah, you got to cast her for, for, yeah, where X is two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. good. Pretty, Pretty good. Um, there's a lot of ways to really take advantage of food. We talked about them a lot, so we're going to move through them. Of course, the only mandatory card ever to be in a commander deck is Gilded Goose. Has to go in this deck. Has to go in this deck. You make got food. Goose. It's the big, it's the Goose Hydra. You need yeah. to have Gilded Goose. You've got to have more Goose. Geese. Um, Gooses. And Gilded Goose takes your food and turns it into mana. Yay! Jahira, Friend of the Forest, is a card that I play in my Samwise Gamgee deck. It's extremely good. Makes your tokens you control have tap add a green mana, so it just makes your commander ramp as well. Uh, and then there's a new one, Knight of the Sweets Revenge, three and a green. Says a very similar thing. Foods you control have tap add green, and then when Knight of Sweets Revenge enters the battlefield, you make a food token, and then... Five green green, sacrifice this enchantment. Creatures you control get plus X, plus X until end turn where X is the number of foods you control activate only as a sorcery. So good. It's a win condition. Really, really good in, in foods decks. Uh, we talked about it already, but it's KCI. Probably goes in this deck too. Eat some foods, make some mana. Yeah, Inspiring Statuary goes in this deck as well. Turns your non-artifact spells into improvised spells so your artifacts can tap to pay for them so that your foods, again, turn into mana. Now you have all those foods, you can make an even bigger Hydra to make even more food. Yeah. And then this card, hate it, Urza, Lord High Artificer, allows you to tap untap artifacts you control to add blue. Yeah, it's Jahira for <laughs> basically. Yeah, Jahira, again. Uh, Urza seems really, really quite good in this deck. Uh, Of course, you can take those foods and also turn them into magic cards with the new Peregrine Took. Sacrifice Uh three foods, draw a card. It also says if one or more tokens would be created under your control, those tokens plus an additional food would be created. Peregrine Took, food Um, of a Took. Shimmer Mirror says you can tap Dragon. your... Shimmer Dragon, excuse me, I autopilot. Uh, <laughs> says you can tap those foods uh, to draw a card. Yeah, two untapped artifacts, draw a card, do it as many times as you want. Seems really good. Adding blue is so nice, because I wish my Samwise Gamgee deck had, had blue. Yeah. There's so much sweet stuff yeah, yeah, in yeah. this, for sure. Um, you can win with Cyber Drive Awakener. This allows, uh, and when it's a battlefield, each non-creature artifacts becomes an artifact creature with base power and toughness 4-4. Four, four. So you just have 80 food, you swing for a billion damage rise and shine does a similar thing it takes your non-creature artifacts and it puts four plus one plus one counters on each artifact that becomes a creature this way it's two mana to cast as a sorcery and it, it's overload for four blue blue it turns all of your food into four fours yeah that's pretty sweet but your your commander also has plus one plus one counters on it so you probably have a little bit of plus one plus one counters synergy on it you could put five counters eight Ooh. counters depending on what else you have on the battlefield yeah that's cool Feasting Hobbit, Devour Food 3, so you can sacrifice the number of foods and then you times that by 3, and this enters the battlefield with that many 1-1 counters. Creatures of power less than Feasting Hobbit's power can't block it, so you could just hopefully hit someone for like 20, you know? This card's so busted. It's so silly. It gets so big. If you sack one food, it's a 5-5. Five, five. Yeah. It's a 2 mana 5-5. Five, five. Five. You sack can't be one. Blocked. Sack one food. If you yeah. sack two foods, it's an 8-8. Eight, eight. What? Yeah. That is a big old hobbit okay this is fun more counters time let's make this thing bigger yeah if you want to be less food focused and more counter focused i saw a lot of people really building around hydras so let's talk about this plus one plus one yeah it's a hydra build i forgot yeah it's a goose hydra how could you forget how could i forget i forgot because i just told you i forgot it's a bird hydra actually it's a goose but it is a bird yeah birds are goose goose are birds wait not all birds are goose geese but all geese are birds. <laughs> it's Thus, a real circle and square situation. Animal sanctuary <laughs> works. Square and rectangle. Yeah, because you can pay two mana, tap, add a one-one counter on target bird, cat, dog, goat, ox, or snake. 
yeah, load up the counters on your commander on it. It's a little free land. Yeah. Fractal Harness is real cool in plus one counter decks. When this enters, you make a high, you make a fractal, excuse me. It's X2 and a green, and that X is how many counters go on the fractal. And then whenever equip creature attacks, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on it. Equip for two. Sounds so like a Hydra. Comes in, makes you a fractal, move it to your commander, get a big goose. Get a huge goose. Uh, doubling season will give you more foods and more counters. Plus they reprinted it with a goose mother on it. That's right. I wonder why. Uh, branching evolution allows you to double up the plus one, plus one counter specifically. And it costs three mana for an enchantment. So it's much easier to get out and then play your giant goose. If you're leaning into the Hydra build, Unbound Flourishing is a must. It's two to green. Whenever you cast a permanent spell with a mana cost that contains X, double the value of X. Wow. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, uh, or activate an ability that has X, you uh, copy it. Yeah, so that's definitely all the Hydra decks that have X activated as well as X, yeah, thing, the, do the thing, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, uh, a new card, new legendary that you may want to build around. Troy on Gutsy Explorer is one green and blue for a 1-3, and you can add green and blue when you tap it, but you can only spend it to cast spells with mana value 5 or greater or spells with X in their cost. So this is like a fun little mana dork. And then you can pay blue, tap, draw card, discard a card. So got a lot of utility. Mm -hmm. um, definitely a lower power mana dork for a deck like this, but it's a fun one. Yeah, this one's cool if you're building that Hydra deck. Uh, Nexus. It's one and a green. This is a human Tyranid advisor. It's from that 40k deck. It says basic lands you control have add colorless, colorless. Whoa. Spend this mana only on costs that contain X. Yeah, that's kind of cool. So it, do it doubles your basics, kind of like the, uh, the new court thing. Okay. All right, Rachel, have some fun. Yeah. A lot of people were talking about building around Hydras, but I think you should build around geese. Bird time. Yeah. Go birds. Put in swan song. How has this become your thing? And birds of parrot. <laughs> I don't know. I actually hate like live birds. Like I don't <laughs> like bird, especially geese. Stop. Yikes. Why do you not like birds? They have creepy little feet. They like do have they are kind of like dinosaurs it's so strange that they're like covered in feathers but their feet are like weird little scaly lizards yeah yeah have you ever seen like an owl without its feathers or like squished really down? really haunting really weird owls can do some strange body horror stuff that you're just like i know you're supposed to be cute but like you your whole you you're not supposed to be able to move it's like that, that picture and maybe the editors can bring it up of like it's like what does the thing inside among us look like or what does the thing inside the fall guys guy look like it's haunting and it's like the big cute outs exterior and then like a weird creepy yeah. skeleton on the inside <laughs> with I odd proportions with birds i can Those only are birds. see they're so spooky uh but i kind of like the idea of this weird sort of green blue bird deck because you get some cool cards ledger shredder birds of paradise some famous birds even thrumming bird is really good in this deck proliferate because that's has proliferate on it nimble obstructionist i think is one of those really powerful like i've been got by nimble obstructionist yeah. so many times and this bird looks like a human it does it's got the weird so it doesn't um, have weird like kefnet bird person <laughs> yeah thing. yeah yeah it says when you cycle nimble obstructionist for two in a blue counter target activated or triggered ability you don't control wow so you can you cycle it to draw a card and counter something stifle powerful. something that yeah. people do not expect. no one ever sees stifle coming never yeah. i've been got by nimble obstructionist so many times and it's really Wait, really this fun. is great because you can finally play two legendary spells that never get played. <laughs> yeah, right? It's exciting. Taunos the Toymaker was one of the coolest legends, in my opinion, from Brothers War. It's three green and a blue for human artificer. Whenever you cast a bee, beast or bird cre creature spell, you may copy it, except the copy is an artifact in addition to its other types. That's cool. And it works for your commander, even though you don't get to keep the second copy. Yeah. It does enter the battlefield and you uh, get the that number of foods because it's an ETB trigger and uh, Taunos is importantly a cast trigger so he right. sees that the casting, X yeah. spell uh radagast wizard of the wilds has ward one and then birds and beasts have ward one too and then whenever you cast a spell with mana value five or greater which can be your commander but also other things you can create a three three bird or create a two two or three three beast or a two two bird yeah radagast you better be choosing bird jorael voice of zalfir it's two green blue for a human druid at the beginning of combat on your turn up to one target land you control becomes an xx green and blue bird creature with flying and haste until end of turn where x is the number of cards in your hand it is still a land whenever a land creature you control deals combat damage to a player draw a card birds so at the beginning of your combat you make like you know a four four or a five five flyer with haste you bonk somebody and draw an extra card off of it yeah also when you swing with your bird commander uh, you sack a food and make it even bigger see pretty wow. sweet 
these pretty birds are sweet. Cute. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of like flying tech that you could put in this deck as well. Uh, the only reason I had Court of Calling on here is because there's a bird art. There's like a Court oh, of a Calling art. Oh, with yeah, like yeah, this yeah. big giant bird. Uh, <laughs> and it's really creepy. And I you th- should play that version. If, if you're you are playing it. this deck and you're going birds with it, you do need you just sometimes need to play tutors to yeah. make your deck yes. actually viable. I uh, mean, to get the big war, big win bird out, you know, yeah. the bird that's going to win you the game. Uh, Denal says, whenever you cast a non-legendary creature spell with flying, you may copy it, except the copy is a one, one spirit in addition to its other types. But it's Denal Herald of Wings. What did I say? Well, that's so why I'm used to Denal. You oh yeah. Yeah. Denal ha- Herald. Cause otherwise it's like spirit. Spirits aren't birds. It's like, yeah, but look at the art, but he's got a bunch of birds There's and they're ghost birds. birds, which is the best kind of bird. Cause they don't have weird feet. Yeah. They have like, isn't there a cold. daze with the Amon Ket thing yeah, that's that has a bunch of birds on it? You got to play that yeah, too. You got to, you have to buy the, the invocation. <laughs> the awful invocation. Uh, daze. You have to, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, there, I forgot. There's two mandatory cards. If you're building, uh, this commander, the other one is golden egg. Oh, cause, cause birds that's its egg. egg. Yeah. And that's its golden egg. Nice. And it's a food. Anyway. Uh, winged that's a silly words. Version. Two yep. in the blue sorcery. Cost one less. You can control a with flying. Draw two cards. Two mana draw two. Pretty Unbeatable. good. Unbeatable. Pretty good. Uh, and Build then, the uh, bird deck. Don't forget Kindred Discovery. If you're doing any Hydra or bird version, because yeah. you get to just draw a bunch of cards and uh, yeah, when they enter and attack. And there's a version with Kenkus on it, which are birds. They're oh, big birds. Yeah. These are... See, birds that have humanoid bodies are fine. Are they? (laughs) They're better than the birds that look like weird on the inside. If you were like looking at a man with a bird face (laughs) and he opened his beak, you'd be like, this is not fine. Uh, uh, Yeah, it's true. But in the world of Magic the Gathering, I think it's more fun. That's true. Because again, we already talked about how birds are just, at least why you don't like bird birds. Yeah. I want, like, I wonder if. Ledger Shredder is a bird with a man body, too. Yeah, he's a bird with human hands, which is also a little weird. (laughs) But they're kind of like feathery. They're, yeah, they have, like, but they're, but they're five fingered bird. Anyway, I, birds are. What did the five fingered bird say to the face? (laughs) (laughs) Not slap. Yeah, yeah, ever, because he gets do, caught by his feathers. Yeah, it's like, because it's not actually a slap. Uh-huh. Do you remember, did you ever do that joke in high school? No. It would, you, you say, what the, what the, the five, face? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's what the five fingers say to the face, and they go, what? And you go, slap, and then you slap them. I don't know, I think that's a boy thing. It's definitely a boy thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. If I slapped one of my friends, she'd be like, um, I don't think we can hang out. Yeah, that's not cool. Don't do that. All right. We talked about eight really sweet commanders today from Wilds of Eldraine. Some weird ones, some puzzles. Some puzzles. I right. can't wait to see how people <laughs> build them. But what's your favorite from the ones we talked about? It's probably got to be the one I played on Game Nights because I love food. Food is my new thing. If you've seen the new Game Nights tokens, I'm hugging a giant hot dog or not hot dog, a, a, a Philly cheesesteak. Yeah. So I'm going to say Bernard Ginger Sculptor, but I kind of want to call him Bernard. Bernard. Yeah, Bernard. Bernard, Br- Bernard or Bernard, but it's Bernard, the ginger sculptor. Better than Bernard, I guess. Yeah, it's true. I like Bernard a lot, and it's so cool because he's making the little ginger people that you see in the the trailer, the original Eldraine trailer, whether it's fighting Garrick. Yeah. That was really sweet. Now that's good flavor. Yeah. Good <laughs> Literally. Good flavor. Mm. Uh, what about you? I, th- I think my favorite of the bunch has to be the one we talked about very first. It's Agatha of the Vile Cauldron. Mm. Uh, Are you sure it's not the birds? I, <laughs> It's fun. I like, honestly, when I was putting the bird list together, I was like, okay, this is actually pretty oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Because there are some powerful birds. So. I also never thought about, like, when I looked at this card, I didn't think, the bird card, I didn't think about casting it for two and just sacking foods and drawing cards yeah, yeah, with yeah, your 2-2 yeah. two, two flying commander. Like, a two that two-drop commander feels more interesting to me than maybe the 10 drop bird right but maybe the first time you cast it it's a two mana two two that draws some cards and then it dies and you recast it as like all right yeah, i've doubled all my mana big. it's a 30 30 yeah yeah it's yeah having a, a hard recastable hydroid crisis is pretty cool it's actually pretty sweet yeah um okay uh, but, but you the like, reason agatha. I like agatha uh she's cooking the bird i i always really liked activated abilities on on my commanders i like fl- like being flexible yeah. i like doing stuff at instant speed um like it's it's half the reason that feldegriff always appealed to me is it's a very ah, instant speed deck yeah it's very flexible and having a deck that's full of like big splashy activated abilities especially in gruel which is yeah. necessarily known for this kind of play pattern is really neat 
Very cool. All right, how about the most intriguing commander mm. from Woe? So this is not most powerful because we've already talked about that, but most yeah. like, hmm, what would you do? The one yeah, that you, you, you'll be thinking about when you go to sleep at night. Uh, I'm definitely not going to be thinking about when I go to sleep. I have better things to think about. Like Goose Hydras? Like Goose Hydras. <laughs> no, but it's probably going to be Agatha because I'm just, like I said earlier, right? This is the deck that every single set that comes out, you can look at every red and green creature and go, does this do good in my Agatha deck? Yeah. So that's kind of cool to me. I love commanders that have future building ability because it allows you to feel happy with the deck over time. Yeah. I will say I, I put Agatha as, as this one as well, but I I think the one, like I Ariette was interesting to me at the very beginning, the black, right. white auras one. And then you dove into it. And and it's I spent a lot of time thinking about it and trying to figure out what that deck actually does yeah, yeah, yeah. versus like what the commander says. And it really had me puzzling out a deck because because like the commander the the art is really sick from Magali and the uh, character is really compelling yeah, right. in the story just overall and I was like black white aura sounds cool I've been dying to build an aura deck uh, so Ariette really had me thinking and I I wish that the ninety nine was more compelling uh, than than like what I was hoping yeah. it would be. When we were talking about Ariette, there it was like a roller coaster. I was like, intrigued, I hate it. Intrigued again, I'm okay on it. It's really it yeah. I, I wish it said like if it in or creatures with auras on them are goaded. You know, or just yeah. or, or like, something that's a draw card anywhere. Yeah, instead of drain keep, life. In, the draining is like I'll figure out a way to win the game. Just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It, it's a really tough payoff a when you to already refuel. have like a pretty bad plan. <laughs> yeah, and auras have always been bad because they're card disadvantage for the most part. Right. And you can't play the Enchantress cards really in those colors either in black, white. Yeah, so... I, I wish Marriott was the one that that really yeah. had me had me trying. But that could be another card again that just gets better in the future when more stuff's printed or they're like, hey, you know what? We need to give Enchantment Aura as a buff and we're going to do some stuff to help them out. Yeah. So, who knows? All right, to the listeners, what commanders do you think are the most interesting commanders in the set? Maybe we didn't talk about it today. Maybe we did. Are you planning on building any of them? Uh, if you are, what are the hot pieces of tech that we missed? Or maybe that we didn't miss that you liked. That you're like, wow, I really liked it when Rachel talked about those birds. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you figured out a really sweet way to build Ariette. Please let me know because yes. she is really yeah. cool. Um, if you're picking up any of the cards that we talked about in this episode, of course, you can support the show while you're doing so over at cardkingdom.com slash command. Card Kingdom has a great selection of magic cards and sealed product. So there is a new set coming out. There are two sweet precons from this set. Honestly, I like both of them a lot. Um so you can pick those up at Card Kingdom or you can pick up any of the strange singles we talked about today. Get your festering wounds. See if, <laughs> see if Card Kingdom has, yeah. has a bunch of those in stock. Uh, I like Card Kingdom, especially when I'm building a new deck because I can put the whole list into, uh, into a cart and they can all get shipped to my door in one safe package. Love I that. When I build a deck, I'm excited about it and I want all of the pieces in my hand as soon as possible. And I trust Card Kingdom to get them there again cardkingdom.com slash command get those cards sleeve them up keep them protected put them on the cool play map put them in the cool deck box put them in the cool binder because you're gonna go trade those cards at ultrapro.com slash command ultra pro is amazing uh i have like 80 ultra pro binders in my house at this point every single play mat i own is pretty much ultra pro um it's kind of crazy actually how much ultra pro product i have because at ultrapro.com slash command you'll sometimes find great deals i one time found like binders that were like 20 percent off and i just bought a bunch and i've never had to get binders since yeah and done. it was great i was like cool i did all my binder shopping i was able to get different colors for the different things i like getting the four uh four binders four by fours yeah so you can actually four by three so you can put a play set of something across the top it's really satisfying to me to do that yeah i agree uh so ultrapro.com slash command is a way to do it they have a great newsletter just tons of product we've trusted them for a long time they're obviously the pros in the business they're ultra pro so go to ultrapro.com slash command to support us there and you're going to probably see Ultra Pro as well at MagicCon Las Vegas if you make it out there because they always have a booth and you can get cool stuff there. But you can also check out Game Nights Live. Game Nights. It is the championship. All of the winners from all of the Game Nights Live from around the country are going to be uniting at Game Nights Live Las Vegas to September play their 22nd winning 22nd to the 24th? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 22nd to the 24th. So it's going to be me, Jimmy, Josh, and Kathleen DeVere from Loading Ready Run playing our winning decks on the big stage. We're planning some really big stuff. It's going to be bigger and badder than ever before. Yeah. Make sure you do not miss Game Nights Live. Uh, and you get those tickets to MagicCon. Yeah, and 
we don't know the exact date that's going to happen yet, but every other Game Nights Live has happened on the Friday of the convention. So if you want to make sure you check out that show, make sure you're able to go to that Friday. It's most likely going to be that Friday again in the afternoon. Uh, you can get the tickets right now. Uh, some of them are already selling out, but I'm pretty sure... Quick. Up, yeah, so just check it out. There's also events you can sign up for already. I know Gavin uh, has his unknown event. There's a bunch of other really cool stuff. So you don't want to miss it. Las Vegas, I'd say, if you're going to make it out to any of the Game Nights Lives or any of the Magic Cons, this is the most fun one to go to because it's a city literally built for your tourism so there's other stuff to do restaurants attractions you can go to the casinos you can watch a show there's lots and lots of fun stuff to do in las vegas i'm really looking forward to it yeah all right big thanks to our amazing team here at the command zone we have damon lenz eric lem megan yep garav galati jordan Pridgen, jamie block arthur mellowcroft lanson long josh murphy jake boss sam waldo evan limberger craig blanchett katie cole mitch traver gabriel poses and how's it it's josh lee Kawhi. And that's going to wrap up this episode. Thanks, thanks. for listening. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it was, it's been a long time. See Literally, you. it's just been a long episode. So thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> thanks for listening. Until <sighs> next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>